This video is a follow-up to my previous one regarding Kindly Beast in Joey Drew Studios. It's a long video, but it's a complicated situation. It's also worth noting because this video only exists because of the responses that video received. Since this is another long, complicated video, I'll just quickly go through the allegations and topics this covers. Kindly Beast, aka Joey Drew Studios, taking down fan games while also stealing fan art, how they treated winners of their fan art contests, responses from bendy content creators, as well as a current employee's response to my video, who was later fired, what new information has come from the now fourth set of layoffs from the studio, how Mike Mood's previous work foreshadowed the Kindly Beast situation, how Joey Drew Studios is being sued for half a billion dollars, how they lied about Bendy's story being planned out, and how that unplanned story managed to release two novels, how a lot of Bendy was taken from another game, the Meatly claiming that Fortnite did the same thing with their game, and finally, interviews with ex-Kindly Beast employees, which covers everything from workplace abuse to Showdown Bandit to Bendy and Nightmare Run, and then a conclusion where I hopefully wrap up the big question of... What now? Feel free to skip to the segments of the video that interest you, but if you're here for the full story, then let's get started. You never really know who's watching. Case in point, I made a video that, well, it initially did just okay. An overall positive like to dislike ratio and more views than most of my other uploads. But it turns out, those who were watching were more than just fans of Bendy. These were viewers with stories of their own and ones they were willing to share with me. Over the last year, I've had the opportunity to hear from fan creators, content creators, and I was even able to interview a couple of ex-employees and share what they had to say in this video. So now I want to bring forward those stories, as well as some additional developments, and reevaluate a few of the conclusions I made prior. All of this was made possible because of one video. So now it's time to revisit that story and learn a little more about the games, their creators, and find out what it was really like inside the real-life Joey Drew Studios. This is a story that those who are a part of it now get the chance to tell. This is the story of Joey Drew Studios. Before going any further, I want to clarify a few things. Because it can be confusing whether I'm referring to Joey Drew Studios the fictional cartoon studio or Joey Drew Studios the development studio formerly known as Kindly Beast, for the sake of clarity I'll be referring to the real life Joey Drew Studios as Kindly Beast. Secondly, I want to be upfront about speaking with both creators and ex-employees. Some of them spoke privately with me, so not all of this information has been made public and all of the ex-employees wish to remain anonymous. Naturally, some of you may be skeptical of their claims, and as such, I've separated the employee interviews into its own segment near the end of the video so that it doesn't affect any of the other topics covered. If you don't believe them, then it doesn't change any of the other publicly accessible information presented in this video. You can skip to it now if that's really what you're interested in, or click the link in the description to read the full interviews for yourself. Finally, not everything here is some grave conviction. I want this video to encapsulate as much as possible regarding Kindly Beast, leaving as few stones unturned as I can. If something big were to happen after this, such as more Kindly Beast employees wanting to speak with me, even Mike the Meatly or Book Past, then I'd probably make a follow-up video to this. But I'd rather have everything accessible in this video so that, if this is the last time I cover Kindly Beast, then I've covered as much as I could. So with that out of the way, I think a good place to start is with the other responses the video received and I feel it's good to jump off with what the previous video didn't cover much in detail, and something that probably affects most people watching this. Fan-made content. Odds are you've seen fan art, animations, renders, songs, or playthroughs of Benny and the Ink Machine, or even made some yourself. This content is prevalent in pretty much every fan base because it's people showing their love of a game through whatever means and talents they have. Kindly Beast has even included fan-made songs and some winners of their fan art contests into Bendy and the Ink Machine. However, Kindly Beast also has a history of not treating all fan-made content equally. Over the years, there have been allegations of them taking down fan games, stealing work from artists to put in their books, and poor treatment of winners of their fan art contest. So let's take it one at a time. Fan-made games can play a huge role in a game's community. GameJoel even has a whole category on their front page that's dedicated to Five Nights at Freddy's fan games. 
At some point, it became common knowledge in the Bendy community that any fan-made games put on platforms like Game Jolt would be taken down. Some developers have even created workarounds, having their download on Game Jolt be a remote download for the full game. It's hard to take down something that isn't actually the fan game, but just to keep providing access to download it. Even so, it's obviously not ideal. One of the most popular fan games before this was called Bendy and the Ink Machine Reese's Story. It was a 2D game with a pixelated art style that used characters, imagery, and sounds from the official game. For reference, Chapter 2 of Bendy released in April 2017, and Chapter 3 wouldn't release until September, around 5 months later and taking over twice as long to release as Chapter 2. Reese's Story first released in May and gradually released its chapters over time, so for some fans it conveniently acted as supplementary Bendy content during that dry spell, even if it wasn't official. It was played by the game theorists, Daco, and others during that time, and also got some really cool fan art. Unfortunately, the game was taken down suddenly in December of 2017, and sometime after, Kindly Bee's treatment of fan games became common knowledge amongst fans. After posting my video, it turns out the developer of Reese's Story, Anorak Warriors, saw my video and was willing to elaborate on what had happened with their game. They explained that, instead of being asked to remove the game by Kindly Beast, or even Game Jolt notifying them of their game's removal, they were left completely in the dark. Quote, That's the thing though, they didn't ask me to, they just took it down without me knowing. If they had asked me, I would have taken it down, I respect the copyright holding. Or if they had just told me why they deleted it in the first place, I wouldn't be so salty now. If they had again just asked to remove the games kindly, I would have, but just leaving me in the dark got me very worried that I had been hacked. I had to just contact Ganjolt to find it out myself." End quote. Posts made at the time by Anorak Warriors on Game Jolt reflect this, showing they thought some troll had hacked into their account and deleted the game. They also mentioned in the post that they weren't the only ones this had happened to, which indicates that this was when the mass removal of fan games occurred, creating Kindly Beast's reputation. So the question that was never really answered was, why? Why take down a free fan game that, at that point, was already finished and had reached its peak popularity months prior? More importantly, why were a lot of fan games taken down at the exact same time? Statements on fan-made content from Kindly Beast are scarce. While the Meatly has encouraged it on Twitter, Sin just randomly posted this excerpt on copyright law on her Instagram. Thankfully, Mike was asked about fan games during the AMA and responded saying, quote, We love it when people get creative with Bendy, and even make fan games, yes. However, as I'm sure you and others are aware, there's some legalities tied to that with our content policy. The reason for this is because we have a trademark on Bendy, and we need to legally protect that trademark, or we can lose it. Trademarks do not have a fair use protection, so there are times when our legal team need to act if it's too close for comfort. If a game or something is made that's too close to our game, or any content we have, it can be considered unclear what the official one is, making it hard for us to do business, and ultimately potentially losing our trademark. Fan games are great. Just be super careful how you make them. Fan art though, go nuts. We love fan content." End quote. So the exact reason for the fan game purge, including Reese's story, is likely found in the Joey Drew Studios fan content policy, a page on the Joey Drew Studios website that covers nearly all fan content. But what exactly does it say? The Joey Drew Studios fan content policy lays out the rules for quote, music, songs, artwork, photographs, videos, fan fiction, and other artwork that is based on Joey Drew IP. End quote. Prior to Reese's story being removed, the last known update to this policy was on July 26, 2017, nearly six months before Reese's story and other fan games were suddenly taken down. The policy is explicitly clear on what you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to resell their games, make any money from fan-made content, imply the fan content was approved by them, create content that is quote, derogatory to our brands and may damage the value, reputation, or goodwill of Joey Drew Studios or our products or brands, as determined by Joey Drew Studios in our sole discretion, end quote, or quote, create fan content that violates the rights of others, or is obscene, sexually explicit, defamatory, offensive, objectionable, or otherwise harmful to others, end quote. By these guidelines, there are a few places where Reese's story may have violated this policy. Section 9, for example, titled Promotions and Ads in Our Video Games, states, quote, You may not use RIP assets to promote or market unrelated brands, products, people, campaigns, or services. This means you cannot create, or cause others to create, fan games using Joey Drew IP that promote or market unrelated products or services in playable form. 
end quote. Reese's story ends with a teaser for their next game which wasn't going to be Bendy related. As such, it may have been viewed as a violation of these guidelines. But the reason that ties closely with what Mike said during the AMA comes from ground rules set in Section 5 and elaborated upon in Section 7. Quote, If you are using any part of our brands, names of any of our games, characters, slogans, features, events, or company, and or IP assets, graphics, characters, code, software, images, sound and audio from any of our games, and any videos or screenshots taken from or our games in any way, then you must follow the fan content naming rule in Section 7. If you comply with all other aspects of this policy, you may use our brands in connection with fan content, including websites or YouTube, if you ensure any name or title of your fan content is secondary to any of our brand names, ensure none of our brands, or any confusingly similar names, are the dominant element or the distinctive part of your fan content name or title. For your guidance, below are examples of permitted and prohibited usage of our brand Bendy and the Ink Machine. Battle of the Tunes featuring Bendy and the Ink Machine Rise. This is okay. Bendy and the Ink Machine Battle of the Tunes. This is not okay. End quote. This violation not only aligns with what Mike said during the AMA, but this would probably be the quickest violation to identify, given that searching Bendy and the Ink Machine on Game Jolt would yield any game using it in their title. So, in some capacity, Reese's story violated the fan content policy and was removed. There's nothing inherently wrong with removing the game, but even so, there's no arguing that the way they did it, well, as Anorak Warriors put it, could have been more kindly. Part of that was due to Game Jolt's inability to properly communicate with and notify Anorak Warriors, but that's a discussion best left for developers to make. Some may argue that Nintendo also takes down fan games, but they're a AAA company and have been constantly bashed by their own fans with how they treat fan creations especially compared to companies like, for example, Capcom. When fans were remaking Resident Evil 2, Capcom asked the team to take it down and then invited the team to Japan to see a preview of the official remake prior to its release. I'm not saying that Kindly Beast needs to invite Anorak Warriors up to Canada for a group hug, but they made Reese's story because they liked Bendy so much, and having their game taken down was, understandably, frustrating and disheartening to someone who had looked up to them as indie developers. Quote, it pretty much felt like they just wanted to crush any sort of fan creator if they decided to do something to show any kind of support. My fan games were just meant to be fan games. Nothing much. I never expected them to get as big as they did. I just wanted to show my appreciation. I no longer support the Melee, but I don't hate him. I won't bash anyone for playing or liking something they like. I just got my reasons, I guess. I won't lie, I felt like I didn't want to make any more games. End quote. But Reese's story was just one game. Remember, other Bendy fan games were being taken down at the same time, and likely for similar reasons of putting Bendy and Nick Machine in the title. By taking such deliberate action due to their fan content policy, it's important to remember that the guidelines do and should apply fairly to all mediums of fan-made content. However, the only other medium in which Kindly Beast has been willing to distribute similar punishment are Roblox roleplay servers. This isn't a joke, a few Bendy roleplay servers were shut down due to copyright infringement. Instead, there are songs beginning with Bendy and the Ink Machine being sold on iTunes, one of which was featured in the official game, but wasn't created by Kindly Beast, and do I even need to answer whether or not there is fan content that is obscene or sexually explicit? I always had a feeling the answer was yes, but for the sake of this video, I had to confirm. Now, as you may have guessed, the next thing I was going to show was a bunch of censored images, but that's become... complicated. As per YouTube's guidelines, I cannot show anything that is even so much as suggestive, even if it's censored, because that censorship would be suggestive. Doing so would risk receiving an age restriction, or even a community guideline strike. So, in the interest of making this video as accessible as possible, I'm going to display the earliest known upload date of various images that violate the fan content policy, as well as a list of details of the events depicted within them. As tempting as it is to have another moment like Ink Daddy, I will not be reading these descriptions aloud. In only two minutes, I was able to find 66 suggestive images and 447 sexually explicit ones. The websites hosting these images were found using very basic search terms, and the images themselves were accessible without the need of an account to those websites. 
Some images date back only a few months, and in other cases, years. Even if the work was commissioned, the policy prohibits sexually explicit artwork based on Joy Drew IP, which includes any of its characters, meaning all of this content is still a violation. The websites also had clear means of filing DMCA takedowns, so it's not as though these websites are acting outside of the law. This content was easy to find and would be easy for Kindly Beast to take down if they had any intention to enforce their policy. But I have yet to find any instance where such a takedown has occurred to any image or artist. Mike claims the reason they take down fan games is because it can be difficult to identify the original game made by Kindly Beast and risks losing their trademark. If the intent is to make sure that fan content is distinct from the original, as indicated by their behavior towards certain types of fan-made content, then the inclusion of guidelines that are beyond the scope of that intent is confusing. Furthermore, coming from a non-Canadian, not a lawyer, by not equally enforcing the policy they created, the policy they deem necessary to protect their trademark, one could potentially make a case that Kindly Beast has failed to protect their intellectual property. Even if Kindly Beast was suddenly compelled to equally enforce this policy, it's just not in their best interest. Partly because they are unable to sustainably manage content on multiple platforms, and partly because the backlash would mean all creators would be nervous about making more fan content, meaning less free publicity. As it stands, they're not actually ensuring control of their IP, but instead suppressing a key aspect of their own community. But that then leads to the second problem with how Kindly Beast has responded to fan content. Stealing it. It's generally agreed that sharing someone else's work as though it's your own is bad. I mean, it's why Kindly Beast's content policy explicitly forbids reselling their game. Legalities aside, it's just generally a really scummy thing to do. If you've seen my video covering Chapter 2 of Benny and Ink Machine, I'd like to apologize, but you'll also recall that I used this graphic of the game's layout. This map can be found on the Bendy and Ink Machine fan wiki, and can be an incredibly helpful tool in guides or just knowing where something is in the game. Shortly after posting my Kindly Beast video, someone contacted me saying that both fan-made maps and renders had been used in the Joey Drew Studios employee handbook, and that the creator of the maps weren't even aware of it until they bought the book and recognized their own work. I asked if I'd be able to speak with whoever made the maps, and sure enough, they were willing to speak with me. The individual goes by the username 434-92449, though I'll be using 434 for brevity, and their maps can be found all throughout the handbook. Every chapter is introduced with a layout of the area, and those maps are used again later to show the locations of bacon soup cans. I wanted to make sure that it was their work and it had been stolen, so in speaking with them, I wanted to find at least one of the layouts used in the book, dated prior to the book's release, and that credits them to it. Initially, it wasn't easy, since 434 deleted any outdated versions of their maps after updating them, and the maps used in the books are an exact match to the wikis, but weren't uploaded by 434. They were uploaded by someone going by the name Camille Firma. It took some time, but I got in touch with Camille Firma, and they had gotten the maps from 434's DeviantArt page, where, sure enough, the maps on there match every map used in the handbook. While the updated maps were released after the book, Camille Firma's uploads of the maps on the wiki predate the book's release. They may call themselves the guy who does the maps, but they were willing to credit the true cartographer as 434, which is more than what you can say about the book. I also feel like I kind of owe 434 after I used their work without permission, so hopefully this helps make up for it. Another instance of art being used by Kindly Beast without credit was one I overlooked during the AMA with Mike Mood, from a user by the name of Meme Lord Spence, who mentioned that their render of the Piper seemed to be in the Joey Drew Studios handbook. They also provided images of the render and of the book where it seemed the render was used. Laying the image of Spence's render over a PDF of the handbook reveals that it's a perfect match. This comment received no response from Mike. After posting my video, Spence got in contact with me, thanking me for covering Kindly Beast and providing further details on their situation. Just like 434, they only found out when they had bought the book and recognized their own render. They went on to explain that they got in contact with Foxygen, who was still community manager for Kindly Beast at the time, who responded by saying it was probably a coincidence, not Kindly Beast's fault if it was, and that they were going to inquire further. She claims that they would want to make it right, but Spence received no response after this. In fact, the answer wouldn't come until after Foxygen had been fired and Spence mentioned it during one of her streams. 
That one guy that you talked to about my render being in the employee hand, like, hey, ML Spence, how are you doing? I do remember. We talked about it because you're like, hey, look, this is like, I did this render of an image of a model and it looks exactly the same and it just turns out and i i cannot believe like i was like oh my god i want to help this person and everyone was up in arms about it and a lot of the devs it was their weekend so um and they were on winter vacation so it was like hey does anyone happen to know and one dev actually happened to say i think i know where we can find out but i'm not sure um even though by and large a lot of the things were selected by scholastic for it but yeah it turns out it was just a great pose for that for that one model i think it was piper in fact so yeah it was their render it's strange that foxygen didn't respond to spence after finding this out though the reason for doing so may have been more with the kindly beast executives unwilling to admit that this was the case as they may have feared it would lead to legal trouble as well as backlash Neither Spence nor 434 were asked if their work could be used, they weren't told that their work was going to be used, and they're not even credited in the legal blurb at the front of the book where all of the assets used are cited. Foxygen claims it's Scholastic's fault, so I contacted Scholastic's Rights and Permissions Director to see what they had to say. Their response was two sentences. Quote, Scholastic has no rights in this title. Please contact Bill Graham. End quote. Bill Graham is Chief Marketing Officer at Fat Mojo. I emailed him, but have yet to receive any response. An email to Fat Mojo's website yielded a response, however they just redirected me to the Joey Drew Studios email. Without any word from Bill or someone from Kindly Beast, it's hard to say whether it's their fault or if everyone is trying to direct the blame elsewhere. For good measure, I got in contact with the book's author, Calla Spinner, and she said that, quote, layout slash design is handled by Scholastic, end quote. With that, the trail had come full circle, complete with a couple dead ends. No matter who's to blame, it still falls on Kindly Beast. Either they lack oversight internally on what is and isn't their own work to use, or, much like the holiday giveaway, they lack oversight on who they give the rights to, leaving them prone to mistakes like this, and it presents something of a double standard. They want to exercise their authority over certain kinds of fan-made content, but don't have control over the official content, and that official content is using fan-made content without credit or consent. It's a mess, and a surprising one given how much kindness and respect has been shown to other kinds of fan-made creations. Though, even that hasn't been without its issues. One topic that was mentioned in the previous video were the winners of the Chapter 5 fan art contest. For context, before the release of Chapters 2, 3, and 4, Kindly Beast had a bendy fan art contest where the winners would have their art featured in the game. When Chapter 5's contest was announced, it was advertised that the winners would receive an exclusive mystery merch box. At this point, the expectation was that the winners would have their art put in the game as well, so when Chapter 5 was released and the winning art wasn't included, it left some confused. Looking back, it's clear that any mention of the artwork being featured in the game is conspicuously absent. And like with many issues to come, there was little clarification or disclaimers from anyone on the team that the art would not be included in the full game, with the only one being a single reply from the Meatly. He mentioned the possibility of the art being included in a future update, though not even the PC version has seen any updates, with the art or fixing any of the prevalent bugs. Then in May of 2019, the fan-built contest was announced, where the winners will have their name and design sold as shirts on the Bendy online store for a limited time, and they will receive $2 for every shirt sold. At the same time, the winning designs for the Chapter 5 fan art contest were being sold on shirts to give an example of how the fan-built designs would be treated. However, nowhere did it say that the Chapter 5 contest winners were receiving any profit from their designs. Without any word from the contest winners, it was only speculation. Fortunately, one found my video and was willing to speak with me about it. Whichever Coma, aka Dalton, creator of the Construction Corruption poster. Quote, An interesting factoid about the contest was the lack of moderation in the shipping of prizes. The promise of winning the contest was the feature of the fan art within the game, as well as the Bendy box. Nothing was ever mentioned about the designs being sold on t-shirts to us, I found out through Twitter, Lamau. The boxes themselves were shipped almost nine months after the contest had ended, with no word from anyone on when slash how they would be arriving. I got in contact with several artists, who also confirmed that their boxes had not arrived. 
This period was long after the hype of the game had died down, so it's very strange that they took that long to ship. End quote. I decided to message Dalton to get some clarification and see what their experience as a fan art contest winner was like. They were kind enough to answer pretty much any questions I had, giving insight on their experience as well as how the company seemed to view them. Given that the Meatly is an artist and understands the struggle from a place of first-hand experience, and Mike has spoken endlessly about how much fan artists means to Kindly Beast, this is an instance where having kind and down-to-earth communication would be expected by whoever was responsible for speaking to the artists. According to Dalton, it was the exact opposite. Quote, the email that contacted us was an email under the name of Bendy Fan Art, and it was completely anonymous. The most interaction that came from the back and forth itself was, hey, you won the contest, sign this contract, thank you. I remember that I had sent several emails asking when the boxes would arrive with no response. End quote. I asked about the contract, and while they no longer had the contract saved anywhere, they were able to recall some details. Quote, the contract itself was a very standard contract, with a bunch of pages talking about legal ramifications and such. But I remember that the only right we would still have for the art is credit. The contract did state that the artwork could be used by Kindly Beast in any way they wanted, but the artist would still get credit for this. What I believed this to mean was that if the artwork was in the game, you'd still have your name in the credits along with it. Fairly simple. But the artwork, along with several other users' artworks, have been used in the games and media since, without any credit. I'm assuming this could potentially be some workaround, but I'm truly unsure. The only time I ever saw my artwork get credit is when it was on the tweet and when it was on the shirt. After that point, any mention or reuse of the concept didn't get anything. And while that isn't an extreme deal to me, other fan arts were used in the Boris game with seemingly no credit to any of those past winners. While my artwork never appeared in the game, the concept of my piece appeared in several novels. The comic book itself adapted every fan art into a comic with no mention of the winners, and my personal winning piece was supposedly used in the Joey Drew handbook according to the wiki, mentioned by name using an easter egg that I had put into the art. It's funny because I put a little easter egg to Gent in my artwork as a funny little nod, and it ended up being used as lore as to why Joey Drew and Gent began working together, and I found this out years after the fact." End quote. I decided to go through both the employee handbook and the comic book to see if this was the case. Oddly enough, their name is credited in the employee handbook, but the poster itself is hardly even visible. The focus being on this message about Gent's history with Joey Drew Studios, beginning with Gent sponsoring the cartoon. When I spoke to Kella Spinner, she said, quote, That was added either by Scholastic or The Meatly. I did have a lot about Gent pipes, but no info from me personally about the company itself. End quote. Meanwhile, the comic book uses the poster's concept, recreating the poster design in the first panel, but makes no mention of any of the artists anywhere in the book besides Time the Hobo, the animator of the Bendy cartoon seen in the game. And it's not just construction corruption. There are other fan art posters that have been recreated in the book. Showbiz Bendy, Train Trouble, The Devil's Treasure, and All Washed Up come from posters created by winners of the various Bendy fan art contests, and whose work goes uncredited. Even if the artist signed away their rights to the work, the law doesn't stop Kindly Beast from still crediting those artists anyways, because at the end of the day, credit should be given where credit is due. And those concepts didn't come from Kindly Beast, they came from fans. Then there was the issue of the shirts. Since the listing for the designs never mentioned the artist getting a cut of the profits like the fan built contest winners, it was generally assumed that they never saw any money from the sales. Turns out, this was exactly the case. Quote, I remember that I found out about the shirts from Twitter, however. It was so strange to me that our artwork was being featured on t-shirts as examples for the fan-built contest, whose reward was that they'd get money for the sales of the shirts. Since none of us were aware, we were never given the option of garnering money for our work being used on things because we had already signed a contract saying we'd get credit and nothing more. I would have preferred being paid for my work being sold instead of getting a box seven months late, lol." End quote. Initially, Dalton claimed it took nine months for their prize to arrive, which would have meant that it arrived in around July of 2019, and with the fan belt contest happening in May, that would mean that their design was sold on shirts before they even received their prize. I decided to ask again to make sure, and they clarified. Quote, I received the box around March, April-ish, if I recall correctly. Sorry if that was misleading, I'm mostly remembering facts right now, and nine months might have been a bit of an exaggeration, definitely was around five to six. End quote. Waiting about half a year with total radio silence is far from ideal, but at least they received it before their work was being sold on shirts. So, 
what exactly did they receive? Between their work not being put in the game, but instead being put into the books, once without credit, integrated into the lore of Bendy, sold on shirts without even their knowledge, and all without any communication on when it would arrive, what was in that exclusive merch box? They provided a photo showing the box and what all was inside. A couple of plushies, some figures, and some keychains. All of which can be found on the online store, so not exactly exclusive, but still not a bad bunch of rewards, around $120 in value. The thing is, this box might look familiar. That's because in around April 2018, a bunch of YouTubers got very similar boxes, also full of toys, to help promote the retail release of Bendy merchandise. Not only could everything in the prize box be found in the boxes that the YouTubers received, but nearly every box I found was of greater value than that of the prize box. Even the letters they received were in better condition. All of them are a tinted yellow with a custom greeting with the YouTuber's name. Meanwhile, the prize boxes starts with a greeting of Dear Friend, and white edges where the page didn't print are very visible. It's technically the only exclusive item in the whole box. These boxes were also not just exclusive to contest winners and influencers. During PAX West in 2018, the Betty Booth was selling mystery merch boxes, and they had a lot of them. What's ironic is that while these boxes may have been valued less than the prize box, they came with a convention-exclusive shirt, meaning that the content of those boxes were actually more exclusive than the boxes the winners of the contest received. You can argue that the artists aren't entitled to their work being put in the game, that they don't deserve credit for the comic book, and that Kindly Beast has the right to sell the winning designs without giving a cut to the winners, or to even tell them that it's happening. But at the very least, when the prize is a, quote, exclusive mystery merch box, then the box has to, in some capacity, contain something that is exclusive to the contest winners, and when compared to a giant bendy plushie, a poorly printed letter would be fairly disappointing. At this point, I wanted to give Dalton the floor, as the person who went through all of this, to give his thoughts and say how he felt. Quote, Honestly, at the time, I was super angry about it. I remember Chapter 5 coming out with me and all my friends streaming together to try and find the artwork because like, woo, I'm in a game I care a lot about, but then we never found it. A couple of months pass, and I didn't get the prize for that time, and I was like, dang, I really got nothing from this, huh? Once Boris and the Dark Survival came out, I was curious if the artwork somehow ended up in there, but they didn't. I stopped really interacting with the Bendy fandom and being curious about the games, but every once in a while I'd see things about my art that I was never aware of. The books, shirts, etc. all came out of left field, and I learned about most of it from browsing the wiki. I was a little angry because Bendy was a huge name, and as an artist during that time, I'm a lot more inconsistent now, I felt it hindered some growth I could have gotten. Nowadays, it's really just funny, especially with the downfall of Kindly Beast, and I'm actually pretty glad I'm not super involved after all. But it's weird to see the contests, which throughout four chapters seemed so cool and so nice to the community, turned out to be pretty weird and unethical. I noticed it a lot more with some of the first contest winners, where a lot of their stuff was used prior to the announcement. It's not to say that anything was really that clever, mine isn't anything to write home about, just a 1920s construction cartoon which are a dime a dozen and made sense logically. It's more so that it felt like, give us free art and ideas, with little to no acknowledgement afterwards. Some of the artworks, not Chapter 5, but previous, were sold at Hot Topic as posters and I'm unsure if the original artist had any mention. It definitely feels like the art was used so that people could see it in-game, want to purchase things based around it, and nothing more. It didn't really have the appeal of, ooh, fans made this. If someone reads the comic and sees All Washed Up or Construction Corruption, it's not even like the games where they were at least showed the names in the credits. I'm sure that there are tons of people who are aware of those stories and don't realize fans came up with them, and it's just a little disheartening. But at the end of the day, all I did was draw a single piece of fan art and won a contest, so it really wasn't my decision on what should be done with it. I just wish it still had the energy of being pushed for fans rather than for merchandising." End quote. What Dalton said about the other winners had me curious, so I decided to track down a few and ask about their experience to see if every winner had been treated so poorly. Bunny Bones, also known as Poppy May, was one of the winners of the Chapter 2 fan art contest, creator of the design of Bendy with an umbrella. This design has also been sold on shirts, keychains, and even had Mike Mood bragging about how it outsold Overwatch at Hot Topic. It's just a black shirt with the yellow bendy holding the umbrella, and it went into Hot Topic, and it was the number one selling shirt, and we we beat Overwatch in their merchandise sales. Uh, <laughs> <so yeah. much. laughs> 
While I began reaching out to contest winners, she happened to find me first, commenting on my video. Quote, Luckily the game wasn't that big, so I did get compensated from the company Fat Mojo for licensing my fan art into merch. Glad I entered that one and not the others. End quote. I asked that they'd be willing to talk about their experience as a fan art contest winner, and they were happy to oblige. Quote, I'm not sure how much I can contribute. The first fan art competition was when the first chapter was free on itch.io, and I really digged it, so I submitted my fan art to get my work in the game. I had no idea that it would blow up like it did. I usually don't enter competitions without some profit to gain. Paid work and all. I was really psyched when it got into the game, and then I was contacted by Fat Mojo to get my work sold as merch. Since it wasn't my original character, I couldn't have a percentage of the earnings, so I agreed to a flat fee of around £100? This was when I just started uni for art, so I figured it would look killer on my CV and have bragging rights to it. Lol. Fat Mojo sent me a t-shirt and a bunch of keychains since they used the design on both products, and I received the second chapter of the game from the Meatly. Fat Mojo and the Meatly were the only people from the game that I was in contact with. That's all there really is to tell, and I'm not even sure they kept the image in the final game or not. Hope this gives some sort of insight into how things were going during the start of production of Bendy. End quote. While I wasn't able to get in contact with any other contest winners, I think the two being from the first and last of the game's fan art contest present a clear contrast on how the winners were treated. While Bunny had contact with Fat Mojo and the Meadly directly, Dalton doesn't even know who he spoke to. Bunny was given £100 for their work being sold on merchandise, and Dalton only found out his work was being sold when someone tagged him on Twitter. Bunny's art was used in the game, while Dalton's wasn't even patched in later or included in Boris and the Dark Survival, but his premise was instead used in a comic book without credit. It's not just that Kindly Beast treated contest winners poorly, but that at one point, they apparently treated them with quite a bit of respect. So, Kindly Beast has shown a lack of respect for fan developers, map designers, 3D artists, and fan artists who willingly give them free art to use in their games, books, and merchandise. It's hard to hear Mike say that they care so deeply about their community when there's hardly a portion of their fans they haven't either taken advantage of or treated with some sort of apathy. You already have such an engaged community that's already yes. so happy with you. It's <clears throat> always great to like nurture them and thank them for... You know, we tried really hard to do that. I mean, that's why we did the fan art contests. Mm -hmm. um, we specifically did those because we kept seeing fan art. And so when we ran the contest and then saying, like, you actually will have your art in the game, and they, the fans love it. That's why we do our best to be a part of the, the community and, and communicate with our fans as much as possible. It's hard uh, and tiring, <laughs> but we, we keep doing it as much as we can. Actually, there is technically one group of creators who hasn't had much of a poor experience with Kenley Beast, besides the artists who are violating the fan content policy, and that would be YouTubers. They've gotten their music put into the game, been the voice and audio logs, and gotten some pretty nice merchandise. That brings us to the next set of responses my video received, and that's from content creators. As I said before, fan-made content is important to any community, and Let's Plays, songs, and artwork have played a huge role in Benny's community, as well as the game's success. I wanted to reach out to content creators in the Bendy community, sharing what I had found and just making more people aware of it. So when I posted my video, I tagged a few content creators on Twitter. Then someone replied saying that nobody would respond to my tweets because they didn't want to ruin their reputation with Kindly Beast, especially when they rely on their games to make content. This provoked a response from SK Pac-Man, who had actually done some of the earliest hacking work on Bendy, leading to Kindly Beast adding Wandering is a Terrible Sin into Out of Bounds areas of the game, and even having Mike in one of his videos. He said, quote, I watched the video but didn't have any other input on the subject. I stopped making videos, not just Bendy videos, but altogether, so I'm not making money there. I don't appreciate being called out for something I'm literally not involved with anymore. Chris's video hit the nail on the head and it covered literally everything I had, so I had no response. If anyone's been to my streams lately, they'd see I've moved on. End quote. It's unclear if he's moved on for good or moved on because there's no new Bendy content. Given his continued support of the Meatly and his video analyzing a Dark Revival teaser image, it would seem that it's the latter. Time will tell, but for now, I'm glad he's expanding his horizons. TZK Unit, a Let's Player who destroyed his headphones while playing Chapter 3, and since Mike happened to see it, had them immortalized into the game, also responded saying that Bendy content isn't really a moneymaker for him. Pra Charles, a popular Bendy theorist, also replied to my tweet in November, which for some reason I wasn't notified on until March of 2021. 
He said, quote, I can only say it scratches the surface, plus Mike took on Jillian's surname, hence the inconsistencies, plus had announced their divorce publicly. Kindly Beast will be fine, I hope they'll be better than last year. End quote. Then, finally, Victor McKnight, popular fan song creator, including one of my favorite Bendy songs, I'm not trying to kiss up to the guy, I just genuinely like face reality, messaged me privately on the situation and said I was allowed to share anything we discussed. Of all the things, I believe this was the most relevant, especially when it comes to content creators. Quote, It's been very hard for me to personally find any further attachment to Bendy than what I've already built. It's become more so a business decision for me to write songs about Bendy. I love the universe and aesthetic, but I'm merely treating my songs toward the series similarly to how their team's leaders are treating the series. And that's strictly as a business venture. End quote. That's important to keep in mind when considering the place of content creators within Bendy's system of popularity. While in a live stream talking about fandoms, Will Ryan of DA Games went so far as to say he made Bendy famous. Me creating the Bendy and the Ink Machine song, I didn't suddenly go, oh, Bendy and the Ink Machine is popular. I should make a song about it. Bitch, I was the guy that made the game popular, or one of the people that kind of made it popular. 60 million freaking views, and it was on Game Jolt. While that might be a bold claim to make, YouTubers, from Let's Players to Musicians, create content of something and can either become popular because that thing is popular, make a game popular, or rise in popularity alongside that game. The problem for YouTubers lies in one key aspect. Their audience. If someone makes, random example, animations of a YouTuber netting the creator thousands of views and subscribers, then the expectation for most of those watching is that, well, there will be more animations of that YouTuber. When that creator no longer makes that content, their growth can become stagnant due to a dip in views and unengaged subscribers. That's why it can be hard to stop making any kind of content, no matter the ethics, because your career can depend on it. This puts them in a much different position than the average Bendy fan. A normal fan no longer supporting Kindly Beast just means not buying Bendy products. For content creators, it means risking their livelihood. What Kindly Beast did was bad, but even if it was worse, odds are that creators wouldn't have much of a choice but to keep making Bendy content. They're trapped, and the only way out is a huge financial risk, which is obviously not ideal. What I'm trying to say is, don't blame content creators. Granted, they're not required to endorse Kindly Beast and encourage you to go buy their products, but don't hate them. If anything, support those who choose to distance themselves from Bendy and Kindly Beast, because that support will be crucial in helping lessen the consequences they'll almost certainly suffer. It's one thing to move on from a topic out of boredom or audience disinterest, it's another to do so out of principle, despite the financial incentive to keep going. On a less pessimistic note, something that surprised me was the response from both ex and current Kindly Beast employees. First and foremost, I want to say that I'm incredibly grateful for the response my video got publicly from ex-employees. A couple of them just had some really kind words to say. I was honestly afraid that my video would seem like I was trivializing their situation since the focus was more so on how terrible their bosses were. I also didn't approach any of them prior to the video's release, given that some guy making a YouTube video on that company that kicked you to the curb wouldn't have been the most welcoming thing in the world. Instead, it seems as though I've somewhat helped make what they went through more well-known. Granted, I figured I wouldn't get everything right, but knowing that ex-employees watched my video, somewhat enjoyed it, and that it accurately covered at least some of what they went through is all I really could have asked for. As for current employees, I did receive a response from one, well, one at the time, Pascal Claro. He commented, primarily responding to my interpretation of a tweet he made during Mike's AMA. For context, during the AMA, and even before, there were individuals who were obviously trolling and being less than kind to Mike and other employees. Pascal's tweet read, quote, I get it, you're emotional and angry, but a lot of you just finished school slash are fresh into your careers. Take the relationship slash lessons you learned and use those to move forward. Revenge, online bullying, and name calling is never the answer. Keep your heads up. End quote. 
Now, I claim that Pascal was implying that it was ex-employees who were, in some way, harassing or bullying Mike, despite no evidence of that being the case. Pascal's comment essentially denies this interpretation. Quote, Chris, just because no one was dumb enough to literally put their names in the AMA Reddit thread, doesn't mean there wasn't a bunch of tweets out there inciting hate and harassment to some of my fellow coworkers from other people on the outside looking in. Hell, you showed one of them yourself. Bullying, no matter the cause, is never good. I made that comment to try and discourage those types of attacks and for my fellow ex-coworkers to keep their heads up. Don't give up and keep making art slash games. End quote. I responded, standing my ground, because the timing and tone felt less like Pascal was discouraging theoretical harassment, but rather discouraging further harassment that was already taking place, though not by ex-employees. While I stood by my interpretation at the time, this is also a tweet, and a universally understood statement on a controversial topic probably takes more than 280 characters. Much like with anonymous employees, I'm willing to accept Pascal's intentions in good faith. It's better to accept it as a possibility than assume an assumption I made was absolutely correct. I concluded my reply, saying that I would be grateful if you were to share my concerns with the rest of the studio, since all I'm looking for is some transparency and honesty. Pascal replied, quote, You know, Chris, I've been in this industry for a long time. Ten plus years as a 3D artist, and before that as a programmer for small startups. I've worked on 20-ish games as both. I've seen projects and studios fall because of lack of experience, childish behavior, hiring the wrong people for the job, lack of management, lack of leadership, lack of sheer basic skill, and sometimes all of the above. I've seen some pretty amazing things and some pretty horrible things. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's just not your place to know. Best of luck, man. End quote. Pascal's comments got some pretty creative responses. Pascal deleted his comment only a short amount of time later, but of course I followed this company long enough that I made sure to screenshot it. I also want to mention Pascal's response of it's not your place to know to the allegations made in this video as well as on Twitter. As Pascal says, he's been in this industry a long time, and nobody, even the ones in charge, gets to decide what information becomes public. I don't think Pascal was somehow pressured into responding to my video or making any statements on the situation. He's not a spokesperson for the company, and other Kindly Beast employees have stayed silent, so to interpret his statement as little more than his opinion would require a stronger connection than him simply working at that company. Nevertheless, the phrase itself is somewhat concerning. If the allegations are untrue, why not deny them? While the allegations may be true, or may be part of an ongoing legal case, it's just as likely that Pascal doesn't know what happened. Matt Goles, a lead programmer at Kindly Beast, was allegedly working remotely during 2019, so it's not out of the question for Pascal to have been under the same circumstances. Either way, if the question, does this company abuse their employees when making their game, or does this company think you're a sucker who will buy anything, are something that would influence your decision and whether or not you would buy their game, then it becomes your business when that company wants you to give them money that would allow them to continue doing what they're doing. I believe, especially when money is involved, everyone should have the right to make an informed choice, and if a company is trying to take that away, it's never for a good reason. That being said, while I believe that this kind of information is important to have available, I don't think what Pascal said here should in any way vilify him. He doesn't control what information is made public, he just works for the people who do. And the events almost half a year later would seem to further support this. I said that Pascal was still an employee at Kindly Beast at the time of his comment, and that remained true for some time. In March of 2021, Pascal, Matt Goals, and Gavin McCarthy were all let go from Kindly Beast. While Pascal and Gavin framed the situation as one where they were moving on, whether they were laid off, fired, or quit has not been publicly documented. Without any confirmation, this may have been the fourth time in three years that Kindly Beast has fired employees without notice. Pascal and Matt have both defended Kindly Beast and spoken to me directly on this situation. 
Not only that, but these weren't recent hires. They were part of the originally small team who helped make the original Bendy. The AI, characters, and environments. To see them potentially kick to the curb despite their time at the company and the lengths they've gone to defend it is, well, scummy. Much like with Foxygen, they certainly didn't deserve this. Especially from a company whose flagship title wouldn't have been the same without their work. Much like in 2019, new Glassdoor reviews appeared on the Kindly Beast review page after the firings were made known, as well as one on the Joey Drew Studios page. Alongside these were some tweets made by those fired, whose comments imply poor management and priorities were again key issues. Before attempting to verify anonymous claims on Glassdoor, it's best to establish what's been stated, or what hasn't, by those involved. While BookPast has interacted with all three employees after the firings, the Meatly has remained silent. While BookPast's behavior would imply that they are on better terms than those fired in 2019, it doesn't exclude the possibility that these employees were fired without notice. Furthermore, the prolonged silence from employees despite concerns from fans isn't very promising. While Pascal's silence may be expected given his statements, you'll recall that Matt's response to me included adamant denials of allegations. Meanwhile, now there's been almost nothing said aside from announcing their departure. What's even more surprising is that the only one to break the silence since then is Pascal. In August, someone asked him about the lack of Dark Revival teasers. He responded saying, quote, Xdev, who knows what's going on over there? Game should have been out two years ago if you ask me. When you focus on the money, you lose the fans slash devs that made you the money. Sad. Just look at what's happening at larger studios these days. Same can happen to smaller studios. End quote. This is a very different approach than what Pascal has taken prior, and I think that this is not only indicative of a change in his viewpoint of Kindly Beast, but given the silence from other employees, implies that their treatment from Kindly Beast has been incredibly similar to those in 2019, fired without notice, and signed an NDA. Pascal's experience with the company is also worth keeping in mind. He's been around since the development of Chapter 3, responsible for a lot of the 3D assets, particularly the characters, the models, textures, and their optimization. He's seen the changes of this studio firsthand over the last four years, and probably has a better understanding than most when it comes to Kindly Beast's reasoning and motivations, so to claim that Kindly Beast's focus is primarily on money is almost certainly more than a wild guess. But Pascal also says that their focus on money has not only lost the studio fans, but developers. Assuming he's speaking to his own experience, it would seem that either Pascal, Matt, and Gavin all quit due to their disagreements with the company's priorities, or that, much like in 2019, they were fired without notice because the board viewed them as too costly to keep employed any further. If history is anything to go by, it's likely that this was the latter. While this may still be speculation, Pascal's statement at least gives some direction as to what happened as well as the current state of the company. Pascal has said that he does not believe it is anyone's place to know the situation, Nonetheless, what he was willing to share here has been incredibly valuable. Now, let's talk about the Glassdoor reviews. The reviews of Kindly Beast were from a game developer and artist, and while the artist's review was written a few months after March, the game developer review seemed to have been written at the exact time as the layoff. The review on Joey Drew Studios was written about a week after, also from a game developer. As one might expect, these reviews were also far from positive. All three tell almost exactly the same story as in 2019. Good coffee, good people, horrible management, and missed opportunities. However, verifying who wrote them is even more challenging than before. At this point, there have been four different firings. The VPs in 2019, the roughly 40 employees a few weeks after, Foxygen in 2020, and now this one in 2021. In trying to figure out who wrote the reviews, it's important to try and find out if they were written by someone recently fired, or an older firing. The easiest place to start is with the artist review. The artist review simply reads, quote, The company closed before it had a chance to really make an impact. End quote. Unless Joey Drew Studios is about to suddenly shut down, then this is likely in reference to Kindly Beast's closure, becoming Joey Drew Studios. The use of the Kindly Beast Reviews page as opposed to Joey Drew Studios is also a clear indication. While it's possible that the phrasing is simply misleading, there's too little information to make either possibility more likely than the other. In this case, it's probably best to dismiss it as being from any of the three. 
The other two reviews are harder to dismiss. Since they were written the week that Pascal, Matt, and Gavin were let go, it seems almost too coincidental. As for their content, while both mention some sort of layoff or firing, having layoffs be plural indicates that they are likely referring to the layoffs they witnessed, one of which they may have even been a part of. Bear in mind, these reviews are meant to help potential employees understand what the company is like, so it would make sense to mention a mismanaged layoff even if you weren't directly affected by it. Again, without any more details, the content doesn't help narrow it down, though the dates help support the likelihood of these employees having been recently fired. Then, there's the possibility that these were written by the same person. Both were posted during the same week, claiming to have been game developers, mentioned coffee and food as pros, and then go on to list off the poor communication and firings as cons. What differentiates the two are their wording and tone. The Kindly Beast review on March 4th has a much more frustrated tone, while the Joey Drew Studios review on March 11th reads as though their time with the studio was more of a disappointment, written in all lowercase lettering. Are these the same people? Personally, I think so. If the firings did happen on March 3rd, then writing an angry review the day after makes sense. A few days pass, the anger subsides, and they realize their review would probably be better off being posted on the Joey Drew Studios review page as opposed to the defunct Kindly Beast, now written in a less aggressive tone. Then again, two employees could have just had the exact same experience with the studio. Wouldn't be the first time. Beyond that, trying to identify any further on who specifically wrote these reviews with such little information becomes more speculative than what it's worth. Instead, the greater focus is on what the reviews have to say. It seems that Kindly Beast, even two years and roughly 50 employees less, still hasn't changed. If anything, they may have become even less concerned with the quality of their products, considering they just fired their 3D art director and 3D character artist, senior concept artist, and senior programmer. These people were integral to the original game's development, so trying to develop a more ambitious sequel without them, or anyone to directly replace them, doesn't bode well. In fact, it's probably worth noting that Sin, Mike's sister, is still working there as HR manager. Given the speculation prior of her position coming from a place of nepotism, I feel that firing the people who helped make the previous game run smoothly over the woman who has almost nobody left to overlook is, well, a poor decision to say the least. With that being all of the details available on the situation, I suspect that, at some point, more details will come to light. Though for now, the optics aren't promising. The remainder of responses from my video weren't all that relevant, but nonetheless surprising. First, I do want to thank anyone who gave a respectful response to my previous video. When the video began to garner widespread attention, I was afraid of what the response from some of the more hardcore Bendy fans would be, but most have been pretty respectful, even when they've disagreed with my conclusions or opinions. If anything, it proves that this fanbase deserves better than how they've been treated by Kindly Beast because even in the face of controversy, they've taken all of these issues with grace and humility, rather than a bunch of dislikes and a comment written in caps lock. I'm not sure if I still count as a Bendy fan, but I have plenty of respect for those who are. Certain individuals from Mike's Reddit AMA got access to the Kindly Beast subreddit where the AMA was hosted, found my video, and now a link to my video is pinned at the top of the subreddit next to Mike's AMA. An individual in the comments to my video asked for money for a cheesecake and after I pinned it, the comment received over a thousand likes in a matter of days and spawned a whole thread that was just really fun to check in on from time to time. These responses aside, there was one other worth noting. One that led me down a rabbit hole into the history of Mike Mood and how Kindly Beast put Mike in a position that he had been in once before. <laughs> It all began when I received an email. Quote, Chris, I just watched your video and was really impressed with the thoroughness of your video. I've never played the Bendy games, but I found it to be an interesting watch because I actually knew Mike for a short time about 10 years ago, when we worked on a Twitch podcast together for about 6 months. Mike and I hung out a fair bit during that time, did some media coverage for a gaming convention in Ottawa, and produced a weekly show with a couple other guys. Unfortunately, nothing that happened with Kindly Beast surprised. Your research in support of and assumptions about Mike's personality were all fairly spot on. But if you had any questions about him, and why anyone who knew him should have seen this coming, 
let me know. Cheers. End quote. Despite my preceding inquiries, I never received a response. Still, I knew that Mike had a Zero Logics YouTube channel, but little else. After some digging, I eventually found it. Game Crusher TV. While it seems most of its content is privated or unlisted, the channel's playlists link to at least some unlisted content. While I thought Game Crusher TV was abandoned, they have since privated two of their playlists as well as one of their remaining videos. Why they still have one interview and one playlist remain public is unclear. If you'd like to see the removed content, I'll be uploading most of it onto Mike's old Twitter account. Searching for Game Crusher TV on Twitch yielded archives of their podcast, the first dating back to April 29th, 2013. So what was Game Crusher TV? According to their Twitch description, quote, GCTV is the next video media outlet for the gaming industry located in Ottawa, Ontario. End quote. All right, welcome to the GCTV live podcast. This is our first show. We talk about games, games, and more games. Who are we? What are we doing? Why are we here? Why are we on the internet? We are GCTV, Game Crusher TV. Uh, we are an online TV network. We are going to be bringing you any kind of news that has anything to do with games. Um, any kind of uh, release dates, anything that has to do with uh, uh, company mergers, or any, anything, anything related to games. We're going to talk about it. Essentially, Game Crusher TV was made to be a new gaming news source, focusing in on the Ottawa area particularly, while also covering bigger names in gaming around the world. They had giveaways and did interviews with developers. Some of the most substantial media that remains public, however, is their podcast. Taking place once a week, Mike, alongside various co-hosts, would discuss the latest news in gaming, their thoughts on the gaming industry at large, and even just what they had been playing as of late. As the podcast went on, Mike and the others made it clear that they not only wanted to focus on gaming news in the Ottawa area, but wished to be different from a gaming news source such as IGN. First thing I want to talk about today, uh, GCTV, who we are, what we're doing. Uh, I'm not going to go too far into why um, I started this. Uh, personally, but I'll tell you what we're all about. Now, there's a lot of websites out there that do video game content, whether it be articles or videos. And, you know, we, we didn't want to jump in and just be another one of those. So we have a lot of uh, different features that GCTV is going to be bringing to the community. Now, we are not specific to any platform. You know, we're not just about Xbox. We're not just about PlayStation or PC. Uh, and genres. We're not about specific genres. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's an iPad, if it's a Windows phone, and there's a game on it, we want to talk about it. Um, also, GCTV is all about promoting anything that has to do with games. If you have your own game site, we'll promote that game site. If you have anything, like if you're developing a game and you need help promoting it, we will promote it. And we are looking at promoting a lot of our local uh, developers here in Ottawa, Ontario. So we will definitely be doing a lot of promoting in Ottawa, but we're not sticking with just Ottawa. That's just where we're starting out right now because that's where GCTV is located. Um, now, this podcast took place eight years ago. Naturally, not everything said has aged well, but that goes for just about anyone making content online, especially anyone trying to predict trends in the gaming industry. Mike may have owned a Windows phone, but Microsoft held a funeral for the iPhone at the phone's launch. He's hardly a fool for having faith in a company that seems so confident in their own product. Still, after having to sift through so much information, some moments were fairly amusing. One of particular irony would be Mike's comments towards Nintendo. What's up gamers? Welcome to the GCTV Live Podcast, show where we talk about games and pretty much nothing else. So, what is coming up on the show? We're actually going to talk about Nintendo. Uh, why are we going to talk about Nintendo? Because they're really terrible, and that's pretty much it. We're just going to talk about how crappy they are, and uh, we will continue to talk about how crappy they are. The Wii U is their Dreamcast, you know, that's this, unless they do something crazy that I can't think of that's going to just, like, blow my mind, uh, this is it for them, you know? They're going to be the 3DS company. You know, they're going to yeah. be the handheld company, then, and that's, that's what they're going to be doing. Man, get, one, get one of these. Get one of these. If you really want to play Nintendo games, I'll tell you that's what, I'll, I'll, play, I'll play Mario Kart, like I've been saying, when it's on the Xbox, and you can play as Master Chief, yeah. and he'll have his Warthog as his go-kart, because That'd we be know that they're going to be the next Sega. 
For context, 2013 was Nintendo's Year of Luigi, a year that culminated in a $450 million loss for the company. In response to poor sales, Nintendo CEO Satoru Iwata cut his own pay by 50%. When asked by shareholders why he chose this as opposed to laying off staff, he said, quote, If we reduce the number of employees for better short-term financial results, however, employee morale will decrease. And I sincerely doubt employees who fear that they may be laid off will be able to develop software titles that could impress people around the world. End quote. Nintendo is not a perfect company. At the time, they were also copyright-claiming Let's Plays and had released a second version of New Super Mario Bros. U, a game that itself was criticized for feeling unoriginal. Despite these issues, when placed in a position of financial strain, Nintendo's leaders were willing to take a hit in order to ease the burden from their employees and believed it would yield greater results. When put in the same position all but six years later, Mike would make a much different decision regarding both the games and those who make them. Say what you will about Nintendo, but at least they have shown their games and employees some respect. One similarity both companies share is their treatment of fan games, and when speaking on it, co-host Brad Rock gave an explanation that felt reminiscent of what Mike said during the AMA. Yeah, the, the risk to intellectual property, Alistair, is that in, in trademarks, if you're not actively defending your trademark, uh, the courts can sort of determine that it, it's not of value to you, and, and can essentially take away that, that, those intellectual property rights from you. And it's a reason why Nintendo is, is historically very, very, um, what's, what's the word for it? Uh, litigious, very, very focused on trying to protect the, uh, their IP rights. Like but beyond moments like these, there were those that began to sound even more familiar. And coming up pretty soon, we're gonna have a lot of videos. Thanks to Jason, he will be helping out with that, doing a lot of the writing and whatnot. So. He is our new researcher and writer. He was once a fan, and now he's a part of the team. And you could be too. You can send us an email at info at gamecrusher.tv if you are interested. And uh, I've been really busy, but uh, you know we got about 11 people now on the team. Um, so far, we got, I don't know, about seven other people potential. Plus, I have a huge number of people that I need to contact. And we're looking at having about 20 people on the team. And uh, it's happening fast. It's happening quick. And we are getting ourselves a studio. Join us. Do it. Join yeah. us. We have some big things happening here in Ottawa. It's going to be awesome. And, you know, you know, we could talk about, like, doing news and shit like that. And, you know, be boring. Like, welcome to Game Crusher TV. Today in the news, blah, blah. No, we're not. No, fuck that shit. We're literally getting a studio. Bunch of fucking dudes. A bunch of fucking beer. We're going to play some fucking games. And maybe some girls. Maybe some girls. I found some girls who are really into Maybe games, some girls. So. Yes. So that'd be cool. And not, not just girls. Cosplaying girls. Cosplaying yeah. girls. You like, so. you like cosplaying girls? Join us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as we have that studio up, we're going to start making content for YouTube. And we're going to be a solid YouTube channel that has a huge team behind us to make it functional. Uh, so, you know, people who do video editing, people who, everything, you name it, anything that goes into video production, we're going to have people involved in it. And that's what's happening with GCTV. We're still around. We're still going to be doing our podcast, but it's a slow transition. You know, as soon as we get enough people, um, we'll, uh, we'll go out with a bang and we'll start with a bang. That's how it's going to be. Yeah. And, uh. We'll Phoenix keep in... from the flames. <laughs> this pot, this, yeah, pretty much. This podcast will still pretty much exist. It just probably it'll be like something this. new. Yeah, uh, a new set, a new name, zero zero okay. one, all yeah. over again, right? Yeah. Like... Mike hiring a full production team, starting a studio in the Ottawa area, and changing the studio's name. When I received an email saying anyone who knew Mike should have seen this coming, I didn't think the events would follow an exact pattern. The only real difference is that Game Crusher TV seemingly disappeared before it ever reached this next phase. But this all begs the question, what happened to Game Crusher TV? The last podcast was on August 11th, 2013, and then... nothing. Nothing was said by any of the other co-hosts, the Game Crusher TV website has been shut down, with the only capture on the Wayback Machine being, well, less than helpful. And with Mike's social media accounts being deleted, there's no way to see if anything was said by him at the time either. Still, I thought I'd try to contact one of the members to see if they'd be willing to explain why the whole endeavor suddenly went radio silent. 
I was able to speak to one, though they asked that I keep their identity private. When I first contacted them, they initially couldn't even recall what GameCrusher.tv was. Hard to blame them, since it's been nearly a decade since then. Though once I mentioned Mike, they were able to recall some of the situation. While they weren't able to explain exactly why Game Crusher suddenly disappeared, they were able to give more details surrounding it. Particularly an event that happened at around the same time. Quote, When his one-time girlfriend later broke up with him, he had something of a mental breakdown. For privacy's sake, I'll exclude the details. End quote. Given this breakdown was severe enough for them to mention, as well as Mike's lead position with Game Crusher, it's certainly possible that this breakdown was either caused in part by Game Crusher's lack of progress in expanding, or the breakdown is what led Mike to lead the venture entirely. They went on to explain what they knew happened to Mike afterwards before sharing what they knew of Bendy, Kindly Beast, and the subsequent firings. What they mentioned between Game Crusher and Bendy is that Mike was a part of Dirty Rectangles, defended Gamergate on a CBC interview, and believes he was later pressured out of the group, presumably for sharing such views. The CBC interview in question has been something of a highlight when it comes to older content regarding Mike. Additionally, some comments made on the previous video claim that using Gamergate supporter as an insult was in some capacity misguided or just absurd. So, let's take a moment to explain what Gamergate was, or is, and what the interview defending Gamergate says about Mike. In October of 2014, Mike went on to CBC Radio to discuss and defend Gamergate. To grossly oversimplify things, Gamergate was a movement that was about issues in gaming and games journalism, such as sexism, review transparency, progressiveness, and other various topics of this nature regarding the gaming community at large. However, the movement devolved into individuals doxing and issuing death threats. Some blamed the lack of organization of the movement for both the harassment caused by it, as well as its eventual decline in momentum. Many, many people have got hurt in, unfortunately, what appears to be a necessary discussion on the role of games media and, more to the point, the ethics of games media in 2014. There's been a lot of hijacking going on on many sides of this particular debate. Some websites have tried to paint it as a misogynist crusade. Some people have tried to paint it as simply an issue on games ethics, but some others have painted it as the unholy influence of so-called social justice warriors ruining our hobby, and their agenda is to drive those people out of the industry. And I don't believe we should be driving those people out of the industry. I believe that we should be informing people. Informed people make sensible decisions. Now, people have this understanding that I was a supporter of Gamergate. Right. And I guess I should clear that up, because, you know what, yes, I was in favour of Gamergate, but that's that was when Gamergate was, as it so often claimed to be, about ethics and games journalism. Mm -hmm. When it first started, it, it, Gamergate was about, I felt, uh, trying to expose the fact that so much game criticism and game uh, reviewing is in the pocket of the publisher. I think the problem with Gamergate is the problem with a lot of movements is that it had no actual clear ideology, so everyone right. interpreted it as they wanted. Right. Yeah. I'm just talking about how I interpret it, and like uh, 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 over time, it just it became either because of how it was perceived or because how it was hijacked, just you know, a hate movement. The Gamergate controversy as a whole is incredibly complicated, but there's no denying the excessive and prominent negative impacts the movement had, regardless of its initial intentions. Such negative impacts are given an example during the intro before Mike's interview. The online clip begins with Aaron McQuiggan, one of the founders of Dirty Rectangles, voicing his distaste for the movement and the impact it's had on those around him. I've talked to several of the people that have since quit uh, games journalism and quit game development over uh, Gamergate threats. And I remember when it first started happening before even the Gamergate hashtag existed, uh, when the initial attacks against Zoe Quinn happened, uh, some of my friends uh, who spoke out against Gamergate were subsequently attacked, and they were what happened to them is what's called doxing. The interview with Mike then begins, where I found out I was pronouncing Desjardins incorrectly. Mike Desjardins, he's an independent game developer. He's with me now in studio. Hi there. Hi. He expresses that those in the movement harassing and doxing people are simply bad actors, are a loud minority, and claims that this is happening on both sides of the argument. So you heard the discussion on of Gamergate on Friday, but I mean, what they're talking about, the threats and so on, are 
out there. Absolutely. So that that part, it's, you're not saying that that's not accurate. That those, uh, those absolutely. Things are there, there's definitely threats that are happening. However, there are threats that are happening from both sides. Uh, people are being doxxed uh, on both sides. And the, the hardest thing to understand about this is that it's an anonymous movement where people still have their personal identities available. So somebody like me, I'm pro Gamergate. If I went online and threatened somebody, people are going to know who I am and I am pro Gamergate. Any, it doesn't stop anybody from anonymously making a Twitter account or anything and then saying, oh, hey, I'm pro Gamergate and then attack somebody. So what Gamergate has done, uh, the pro side, is gone out against harassment and against threats. We do not support this whatsoever. We've raised over $5,000 to prevent suicide. We've raised over $16,000 in bully prevention. So this is not a hate group whatsoever. And Mike explains that he affiliates with Gamergate as a push for transparency in gaming journalism. What is it that you, you support then about the movement? And I just want to clarify again, you're not supporting the bullying, Absolutely. the harassment of, of the, the females who are out there as well. What is it about the, the original Gamergate idea that you are supportive of? So it's about ethics and journalism, transparency and gaming journalism. That's what Gamergate is about. The host then mentions to Mike that Eric is anti-Gamergate and that the last Dirty Rectangles get together, the founders made it clear that they are all against it. In response, Mike said that he left after hearing that. We heard from Eric McQuiggan a moment ago, a co-founder of Dirty Rectangles Game Collective, and he told us the founders made it pretty clear at their last gathering they are anti-Gamergate. How did you feel about that? Um, I left. Uh, I am a regular at Dirty Rectangles. Those guys are the greatest guys ever. If anybody is listening who wants to be a game developer, look up Dirty Rectangles. Those guys are awesome. Um, but, Since there's a bus coming, okay, but, yeah. Uh, for for that, uh, when that was mentioned, I just felt uncomfortable personally, because I didn't I didn't want to talk about it. That's it. I just didn't want to. I didn't feel like it was the place to talk about it. Uh, much like you don't talk about politics and religions to your best friends and stuff like that because it could cause Except conflict. if it's an issue that's happening in, in your field, and this is something that Eric wanted to take a stand on, and he wanted to say, hey, we are against this. Unfortunately, what's happening now is you have two sides. People don't like to call them two sides, but there are two sides. There's the pro-Gamergate, uh, pro anti-Gamergate. Both sides are yelling past one another. They, so the anti side is saying this is what it's about. Pro side is saying this is what it's about. So I felt uncomfortable because I didn't want to have to stand up and say, whoa, hold on, why, why are you anti? And then it was just a huge huh. argument of yelling past one another. He explained that he believes that, as a developer who is actively defending Gamergate on public radio, this game development collective should not discuss or make any stance on Gamergate because there will be no discussion, but instead a shouting match where nobody is really engaging in a conversation. It's not hard to see how Mike seems to have good intentions, while also being a little hypocritical. As I said, the CBC interview has circulated quite a bit throughout the Kindly Beast controversy. It reached a point where the uploader of the interview on YouTube updated the description to clarify that Mike has no involvement with Gamergate nowadays, and to not contact Mike about it. Mike made it clear during the AMA that he isn't a Gamergate supporter anymore, and given that this clip is about 7 years old, the notion that Mike supports Gamergate today based solely on this interview makes for a poor argument. He certainly did at one point, but it's hard to say that he does today. What is worth noting is that Mike was willing to walk away from our Dirty Rectangles get-together due to his disagreements and proceeded to criticize them publicly over those disagreements. It at the very least shows that Mike has not been a stranger to controversy and backlash to his local community even before the Kindly Beast firings. With the radio interview taking place only a year after Game Crusher TV's final podcast, for Mike to go from wanting to uplift and spotlight the Ottawa game development community to now publicly standing in opposition to one of their biggest collectives and its leaders is quite the turnaround. It at least explains why those in Mike's community used Gamergate supporter as an insult and it's partly because he not only felt it was worth defending, but was worth bashing and abandoning his peers over. If they have a chip on their shoulder, it's hard to say that Mike didn't earn it. For good measure, I spoke to a Dirty Rectangles organizer to see if this was the inciting incident that distanced Mike from them. They told me, quote, He left the get-together because we said f*** Gamergate on stage, and I guess that made him uncomfortable. We didn't explicitly ban him until the Kindly Beast firing. It would have been the first time we publicly said anything negative about Mike as many of our friends worked with him. We were cool with mostly ignoring him in the intervening time." End quote. 
I was unable to find out if Mike attended another Dirty Rectangles get-together or attempted to reach out to anyone after the interview. It would seem that Mike either said what he said during the interview, knowing that he would be burning bridges with Dirty Rectangles, or he at least appeared to reserve himself to that following the interview. There are a few other things about Mike I want to mention briefly before concluding this segment about him. During the AMA, someone implied that Mike had been charged with drunk driving, had to install an ignition interlock, a device that requires you to prove you're sober before starting the vehicle, and then found a way to bypass the interlock. While Mike doesn't admit to bypassing the interlock, he does admit to having a DUI, pleading guilty, and not drinking for three and a half years after, a claim he also made a year earlier in 2018. I haven't had a drink in three and a half years. So hey, congratulations. <laughs> uh, Think about starting again. <laughs> oh, man. Given these statements, it seems that Mike's DUI occurred in 2015, but I wanted to find documentation to verify the date, as well as see if there was any merit to the accusation of him bypassing the interlock. I decided to try searching Mike's name in Ontario's official website for civil court cases. The issue is that, due to Canadian case privacy, very little information on a given case is provided, so I'm unsure whether any of the Michael Desjardins mentioned are the same ones, let alone if any of them are Mike Mood. While I wasn't able to identify the case of Mike's DUI, there is one case that is definitely Mike Mood, and it's Fat Mojo vs. Joey Drew Studios. <laughs> Filed in December of 2021, Fat Mojo, producer of Bendy Merchandise, is suing Joy Drew Studios, Mike Mood, and Carmen Interactive over the amount of $435 million. Unfortunately, Canadian case privacy means that this is all the information readily available to the public. But there are certain details that can paint a bigger picture. Fat Mojo has been responsible for the production of most Bendy Merchandise, from plushies to pins to figures. Their staff were even credited for merchandising within the end credits of Bendy, and they're credited as publishers for the Bendy mobile game, Bendy and Nightmare Run. Merchandising has been a huge part of Bendy's monetary success, and with Fat Mojo having a hand in a Bendy mobile game which allowed players to purchase merchandise from the app, as well as producing the merchandise itself, a $400 million lawsuit could include a multitude of potential reasons behind it. Since they're suing Carmen Interactive, a studio that worked on Nightmare Run and the mobile port of Bendy, but was, legally speaking, quote, gobbled up by Kindly Beast, end quote, in 2019, citing them alongside Kindly Beast means the case, at least in part, has something to do with something that Carmen Interactive was a part of. So it's safe to assume that at least part of this lawsuit has to do with Nightmare Run, since both were directly involved with its development. Now let's talk about that number, 435 million. Is that a random number they picked, or is it something more specific? Well, if anyone is going to know how much money you make, it's going to be the people making you that money. Granted, that number might be slightly exaggerated in an attempt to intimidate Kindly Beast, but if that's the case, Kindly Beast won't be intimidated by a number they know is too high to be realistic, and Fat Mojo knows this. So $435 million has to at least be within the ballpark range of what Fat Mojo believes they're actually owed. The other possibility is that this is the estimated value of Joy Drew Studios and Carmen Interactive including their IP. If this is what the value is based on, this would mean that, should they win, Fat Mojo will own the rights to Bendy, Showdown Bandit, and any assets pertaining to the company, including the unreleased version of Showdown Bandit and the yet-to-be-released Bendy in the Dark Revival. However, Fat Mojo's case would need to be incredibly strong for them to succeed. As of recording this, all three defendants are not being represented by any lawyer. As for the plaintiff, Fat Mojo has hired Matthew Carabas, a lawyer and partner of Gowling WLG who specializes in class action lawsuits, commercial litigation, and international arbitration. I actually spoke to Matthew, and he was able to confirm that he represented Fat Mojo in their lawsuit against Kindly Beast. He also said, quote, If I can clear anything up, or if there is anything you would like to discuss regarding the lawsuit, you can refer those matters to me. End quote. Unfortunately, any questions asked beyond this point were met with silence. It's likely that Fat Mojo and or Matthew simply don't want to reveal details of the case prior to the trial, especially if they're attempting to acquire the studio itself. That, or the lawyer working on a case worth half a billion dollars, might have more important things to do than reply to every email he gets regarding the case. Outside of this case information, there's also the potential fallout this case has already created. During the first week of January 2022, roughly a week after the lawsuit was filed, 
The Bendy Online store displayed this message. Quote, We will return when the Dark Revival begins. End quote. The store wasn't expected to close for very long, and this lawsuit wasn't common knowledge at the time, so many speculated that the game would release and the online store would reopen on February 10th, the day of Bendy's fifth anniversary. However, as of recording this, the game hasn't released and the store has remained closed. The online store had a tendency to show off character designs early, so it's possible that Kylie Beast closed the store to avoid leaks, but the timing is pretty coincidental. That's all the publicly available information. While some have characterized this lawsuit as Fat Mojo stealing half a billion dollars from Kindly Beast, it's important to note that the case itself hasn't even gone to court yet. So, no money has changed hands, and that Fat Mojo may very well be entitled to the listed amount. Just because something is legal doesn't make it ethical, but Kindly Beast, and Mike particularly, have treated those terms as though they're interchangeable. So the irony surrounding these circumstances is what I'm going to assume is Canada's systems of checks and balances, or is just plain karma. So, Fat Mojo believes they are entitled to half a billion dollars from Kindly Beast, at least partly in connection to Carmen Interactive, and it might have led to Kindly Beast temporarily closing their online store. The obvious question to all of this is, why? What could have led to this? While it may be speculation, I can see three potential reasons. The first is that Kindly Beast hasn't been divvying the earnings of merch sales with Fat Mojo, and so Fat Mojo has decided to take them to court in order to get what they're owed. Since merchandise can be purchased on the Nightmare Run app, they're claiming that both Kindly Beast and Carmen Interactive owe them money. Either in response to the lawsuit or at the advice of their legal team, Kindly Beast shut down their online store so that no one is actively benefiting from merchandise sales in the meantime. The second option is that Kindly Beast has decided to part ways with Fat Mojo and was planning on doing so at the start of the new year they would close the store while they look for a new production partner. After finding out about these plans, Fat Mojo believes this is a breach of their agreement and that the time their arrangement should last for would yield them $435 million and is demanding that they're either compensated the estimated amount or that their partnership with Kindly Beast continues. Since Nightmare Run is still available and players are able to make purchases from the app, they're also suing Carmen Interactive as a branch of Kindly Beast which has benefited from Fat Mojo's involvement. Finally, there's the fact that Bendy merch probably hasn't been selling as well over the last couple of years, but they've still been producing new merchandise. Bendy and the Dark Revival action figures, blacklight plushies, and so on. But when your game is no longer relevant, and the new one isn't out yet, then the merchandise probably isn't going to sell as it did back in 2018. Meaning that Fat Mojo has invested a lot of money into production and storage for merchandise that isn't being sold. When you've spent the last three years sitting on toys you're either unable to sell or not allowed to sell due to spoilers, because those sales are dependent on a studio releasing a game that they could potentially spend the next five years working on, you're probably in need of money that they're not obligated to provide. That's not even considering the possible millions they had wrapped up in Showdown Bandit merchandise that went unsold. One could even say that it was Kindly Beast's fault for scrapping the original Showdown Bandit and releasing a more mediocre title, which in turn led to poor merchandise sales. So Fat Mojo may have decided to part with Kindly Beast and is suing them for both the cost of merch production as well as the profits they believe they should have earned from sales. This, of course, is all speculation. Again, it's possible that Fat Mojo is suing Kindly Beast for multiple reasons and that the online store closing is a coincidence. I was nearing the end of the video when I found this, and I spent an extra few days looking for answers, all to no avail. If the reason why Kindly Beast is being sued by Fat Mojo for $400 million has been made public somewhere, I wasn't able to find it. At this point, it could lead to Kindly Beast losing their IP, meaning they could no longer rely on brand recognition to make a profit, but would instead have to depend on their reputation, or this could be settled out of court and become another obscure footnote in the company's history. It at least shows that Kindly Beast has, over the years, processed revenue of tens of millions of dollars in sales, and are far from being a small studio in terms of success. While some of that money may have gone to production costs, legal fees, and studio funding, some of that does go into the pocket of the company's leaders, and Mike hasn't been shy of sharing his lavish lifestyle. One last thing about Mike I was made aware of was, of all things, his Facebook page. There's not much of note aside from his giant house, new car, and affinity for taking selfies with a cigar in his mouth, and I'm just going to let the 1930s cartoon villain jokes write themselves. And... That pretty much covers Mike, as well as the responses from my video. However, there's more from the previous video that's worth revisiting and analyzing further. And that's the writing of Bendy. <laughs> 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 
When Mike admitted that the get it done good enough mandate was something they had implemented at Kindly Beast, he defended this in part by saying, quote, We innovate in other ways, by our stories, our characters, and our brands, not by how we make our games. End quote. By saying their stories and characters are good enough reason to not care about the quality of production, be it innovation or just basic functionality, this then brings into question the effort placed into those areas. How thought out their story is, how they create their characters, and how innovative their writing is overall. Chapter 5 of Bendy and the Ink Machine was controversial for many reasons. While the unaddressed bugs are objectively an issue, others were more disappointed with how the story ends, as it seems to present more questions and few answers. The game's mystery had been endlessly theorized on from the very beginning, using parallels between the 1930s Disney and Fleischer Animation Studios, parallels between various monsters and their human counterparts, and analyzing the themes of gods and worship presented in the game's earlier chapters. These mysteries weren't out of nowhere either. Throughout the game, the player is presented with plenty of mysterious elements and unexplained events. Flashing images, ghostly visions, Bendy's inconsistent behavior, Henry's motivations, and themes of worship of both Bendy as well as Joey appeasing some kind of gods. It's generally understood that if something is presented that doesn't make immediate sense, it will be important or explained by the end. Instead, none of these are explicitly told or hold any clear narrative significance. So was the game just being misread and overanalyzed? Maybe a little. But it's not just the game itself that sets these expectations. On June 19th, in between the release of chapters 2 and 3, The Meatly and Mike did an interview where they discussed the story. Particularly, Mike had this to say. When the game became popular and people liked it, um, like, The Meatly and I had to sit down and be like, okay, what, what's the story, right? Like, what mm -hmm. is the whole point? And so we had the story, and we continued to build on the story. So at this point, they claim to now have the story planned out. A week later, The Meatly uploads a Q&A video where the first question is about Bendy's story. Do you have the whole story in mind, or are you still working it out chapter by chapter? Bendy is a very complex universe of interesting characters, both human and cartoon alike. But the truth is, from the beginning, I've had the whole story in mind. I know exactly where it's going to go, I know exactly what each character is going to do, and it's just a really cool thing to see it all come together like this. Yes, little things change here and there between chapters, but the main story itself has still remained untouched. So it's not just that they plan the story, the Meatly claims that he knows the whole story with a direction for every character. This would mean that any mysterious or unexplained events would have a clear explanation, right? Not much regarding the story was mentioned until September of 2018, nearing the release of Chapter 5, where in an interview, Mike said this. You know, it was, it was a complete accident. Um, you know, we, we'd like to say we knew exactly what was going to happen, but, but really, at the end of the day, we knew the beginning and we knew the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Everything that happened in between was, was kind of developed as we went along. Things kind of progressed and changed. Uh, like, a, an example would be, in Chapter 2, we had a poster of Alice Angel, mm -hmm. and that was just one poster off in the corner, whatever, and the fans just started doing fan art, and they just fell in love with the character, and there really there was nothing explaining what this character was. Yeah. And at the time, we were getting ready to jump into Chapter 3, and it made it really obvious that Chapter 3 should be about Alice Angel, right? So... Then in December of 2019, during Mike's Reddit AMA, Mike was also asked about the lore changing during the development of Bendy, and says, quote, We knew exactly how Bendy was going to end in the apartment and the door and everything during the development of Chapter 1. How we got there, however, well, that's the creative process we love so much. Anything can change, but the main points to the story stick. It just depends on how it's played out." End quote. Mike also said something similar during the interview in 2018. But the end of the game remains the same as it was from the very beginning uh, of when we started working on the game. So we already knew what it was about. And so... Setting aside the contradictions, if the ending was the only concrete thing planned, why did it leave so many people confused? Well, Mike implies that this was actually by design, that their intent was to have people theorize over the ending rather than present a concrete explanation. Benny and the Ink Machine, at the end of chapter four, or chapter five, sorry, it, 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 it explains what the story is and it brings it to a close. And, and it does answer a lot of questions and it does raise more. However, what we have done is left it up to the community. So if you play the game, and you play the game, and you play the game, 
<laughs> and your your name is Mad Pat, and you like to <laughs> theorize. Uh, you, you, there's a chance you're going to figure things out and actually be able to understand what what we were talking about. The problem with that is because the ending doesn't explain things. There's no guarantee that there's an actual answer, because Kindly Beast has used fan theories to help write their story. Going back to that AMA post about the game's ending, Mike adds that, quote, The perk to an episodic game is that sometimes theorists, or just straight-up feedback, will give ideas to expand upon our universe and story. End quote. Now, I'm not going to discuss the legalities of using fan-made content without credit or consent. Ethically speaking, using a fan's interpretation of your game and presenting it as though it was your story that you had planned out this whole time is deceptive. But that aside, it's possible that the ending was made abstract in order to generate further discussion of the game, or that none of it was planned and they were hoping to have theorists essentially make sense of it for them. Either way, it's clear that the Meatly and Mike have been dishonest about how much of their story was planned. And they've had opportunities to fix it. Chapter 1 alone was updated three different times, each adding and changing various details. They could have patched in a full coherent story that foreshadows the ending as early as the very beginning of the game. Instead, it's full of dead ends and questions designed to have the players continue talking about the game long after its release. A labyrinth with no exit, a maze with no prize. As for their characters, during the AMA, someone asked why the projectionist doesn't get much love. In Mike's response, he says, quote, Not much research goes into these characters. We just kind of make them and moved on. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. End quote. This also brings us to a point I feel I should clarify from the previous video. That being in regards to representation. During the AMA, Mike was asked if there were any LGBT or minority characters in their games. Mike's response was, quote, We've built a universe where characters are defined by what they do, not who they identify as." End quote. Taking what Mike says here would imply that each of their character's entire purpose is narratively justifying the player to do something. And this actually applies to a lot of characters within their game. They want to have the player collect objects from around the studio, so they have someone mention that their boss is making them do that to appease the gods. The player needs to search for keys, so they have a janitor who loses them. The player fights an amusement park ride. They say it was built by a proud architect with a grudge against Joey. Now. This method isn't inherently a bad thing. I prefer games that have story and reasoning behind them, but this method doesn't create a story with any depth. It only creates characters that are exactly what the developer needs to get the player to the next gameplay moment, and nothing more. Typically a game will then build a narrative arc or theme around the character, but as Mike says, they make them and move on. This all becomes apparent in Chapter 5, when, instead of creating a conclusion for any of the characters in a way that interacts with the narrative climax, the game essentially dismisses most of them before giving them happy endings written on a corkboard. It's also why Kindly Beast has trouble writing minority characters, because the characters they create are designed to serve one primary plot function at a time. For them to naturally write in a black or gay character would require them to create something that could only be explained by writing a black or gay character. And that character's only key trait would be that they're black or gay, because that's all the plot would demand of them. However, there is a character whom this rule doesn't apply to, and their character, including their sexuality, is essentially the crux of nearly two whole chapters. Chapter 3 revolves around Alice Angel, specifically a version of her that's been twisted in a way that's imperfect and is obsessed with achieving perfection. Throughout this chapter, the player discovers that Alice is actually Susie, Alice Angel's voice actor, who began to develop a relationship with Joey Drew before she finds out her role as Alice has been given to another woman. It seems that Alice's insecurities and desire for perfection are in part due to Joey's betrayal. Once upon a time, there was an angel, and she was beautiful. She was perfect, no matter what Joey says. This plotline is dependent on a character having an attraction for another, and its depiction at times is hardly platonic. Quite the charmer. He even called me Alice. I liked it. This story, which unfolds in Chapter 3 and concludes in Chapter 4, is in part due to Susie's heterosexual attraction towards Joey Drew and how he manipulates her because of it. This is exactly how to implement any identity traits into a story that serves a greater narrative being told by having those traits interact with other characters in the story. So how is this story created when Kindly Beast's writing is all about justifying the gameplay? Because of fans. 
Like Mike said, fans liked Alice Angel, so their focus then became a chapter dedicated to a real-life version of that character. The only reason Kindly Beast was compelled to focus on telling a story that explored a singular character was because they saw the fans liked a character featured in a single poster. They have shown that they had the capacity to write characters with depth, but have only done so once. Some people think I'm forcing a political agenda of representation, and it's really not meant to be. The point is, not only is the reasoning inconsistent, but it highlights how poor the character writing process for Bendy really is. I mean, Mike says that one of the game's strengths should be the narrative. A lot of the success with Bendy and continues to be the success is the is like the art style mm -hmm. and the story. Like so, the art style and the narrative are the two main focuses of it. But everything presented thus far shows a clear lack of forethought in what they consider to be both the game's and the company's primary strengths. Such a strength that they feel it warrants disregarding quality regarding other aspects of production. This all led me to an interesting question. While looking over clips of Mike and the Meatly talking about the story, I recall that the person who originally asked Mike about LGBT characters and minorities makes a point to focus on the game specifically, and not the novels. That got me thinking. How does someone write a novel about a game with almost no story? So, after not touching it for nearly two years, I decided to reread it and find out. The first Bendy novel, Dreams Come to Life, is interesting to read even without the information that came out through this controversy. The Bendy Wiki article for the book states at the bottom that, quote, most unexplained lore is explained in this book, end quote. Granted, that makes it sound like the book is game DLC you have to buy at a bookstore, but anyway, what's it about and is it any good? For those who haven't read it, here's an oversimplified synopsis. Dreams Come to Life follows the events of a 17-year-old Buddy Lewick who takes a job at Joey Drew Studios as its cartoons are falling in popularity. At the same time, his estranged Polish grandfather suddenly moves in with him and his mother, meaning both his home and work life have drastically changed. Buddy finds out his grandfather is a great artist and tries to learn from him at home, while at work, Buddy continues to encounter strange events at the studio. The book's perspective is that it was written by Buddy after the studio has fallen and Buddy is trapped inside with his writing primarily addressed to Dot, a woman he befriended during his time at the studio. The book is good. I would say that that's just because some part of me still wants to enjoy Bendy, but I think it's actually a much more competent take on the franchise than what's been presented in the original game or its spin-offs. Part of what makes the book somewhat refreshing is that it's clear what events in the book actually happen. There are plenty of events throughout the game that might not be real, up to the entirety of the game itself. In the book, it's clear what's real and what's a hallucination or a dream, and about 90% of the events in the book are unmistakably real. Even when things reach further into fiction, the book makes a point to say that it's all actually happening. Quote, It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a lie. I had heard sounds, I had seen the floor shake, and I had been pushed to the floor. All of that happened. I knew it had. End quote. That, and a book doesn't crash when you try and open it. The writing itself is also pretty good. Despite my main hobby being video games and making videos, I've done my best to read both standard books and video game spin-offs over the years, and Dreams Come to Life is one of the more engaging and easy to follow, especially in the first half when it's having to establish the characters and their dynamics with one another. It's nearly 300 pages, but it takes time to establish everything going on rather than rushing through it as quickly as possible. The writing at its worst has lines like, quote, the ink never disappears. It's always there, like it was hiding, waiting to reveal itself. It's always there to remind you. It'll never go away. End quote. Which felt a little too pretentiously emo for me, and whenever it has to deal with any supernatural ink events, it can be a bit tacky. However, at its best, it manages to tastefully integrate topics of identity that Mike dismissed. For starters, Buddy's family is Jewish, and so when someone asks if he is, he gets defensive because he was bullied in school for it. The animation department consists mostly of women, and after Joey lets Buddy keep his job after stealing supplies, Buddy notices that his supervisor seems to be bitter about it, calling it, quote, an old boys club thing, end quote. Buddy begins to wonder if Joey, quote, was more forgiving towards people who looked like him, who reminded him of himself, end quote. And then Joey just outright says it on page 185. Quote, 
Miss Lambert? Yeah, well, she's a good worker, but she's a woman, buddy. What does that mean? It means they don't always understand business. End quote. Jacob, one of Buddy's co-workers, is also black, and it's not even made clear until a third of the way into the book. Again, after nearly being fired, Buddy is talking to Dot when Jacob comes over and says that he's glad Buddy wasn't fired, and that it can be hard to get noticed. Dot agrees, and Jacob says, quote, If anyone knows what it's like to be ignored, it's the woman and the black man. Trust us on this one. End quote. Everything about Jacob so far has been about his place in the studio and how he treats Buddy, so it makes sense that this is when we find out, because it's about how Jacob is treated by those around him. The book also has little things like teenagers getting drunk, though back in the 40s it was legal, meanwhile the game doesn't even reference alcohol. At one point it also had Norman say to Buddy and Dot, quote, Never seen a bunch of teenagers sneak around so much like you two and yet not fool around at all. End quote. Clearly the book is willing to take a more mature tone, which is more than welcome when it's done to help build out the world and give characters depth. But the most shocking thing in the whole book comes just before chapter 18. In fact, I'm going to put a content warning ahead for certain events of World War II. Nothing is described or depicted, but it does describe the tragic aftermath of those affected. Okay, for context, Buddy knew that his parents tried to convince his grandfather to move to the States when he was a baby, but that was it. Buddy says that when he discovered a painting sold at an auction for $10,000 looked like the ones they had lying around at his house, he told his mother they could sell the paintings and live a better life. She refused, tearing up as the discussion went on. This all culminates to the moment Buddy finds out the ink is dangerous, and remembering that he brought some home, he realizes his mother and grandfather are in danger. He rushes home in time to save his sleeping grandfather from the ink, quickly washing it off of him. To accurately convey what follows, I'm going to read an abridged excerpt. Quote, the ink had been pushed away, but beneath it more ink revealed itself. Numbers. A tattoo. Why didn't you tell me? There was so much to tell, Ma said. Start at the beginning. Like there is such a thing. There isn't a beginning. There is only a moment that makes the moments that follow matter. Your pa wanted to come here. He wanted opportunity. I wanted your grandfather to come with us, but he had a job. His students. Then, then things started to get scary over there. I begged him to come. He was my only family left, and I thought he needed me as much as I needed him. But he refused. He wouldn't come. He needed to stay for his community, he said. But he did send us his art collection. That he wanted to protect. Not himself. She looked angry and sad and so very tired. I don't understand. Because they're worth something? What's so important about these paintings? To him, art is more than just a pretty picture. It's history. It's... your soul. Yes. The Germans had invaded. They were taking everything. He wouldn't leave anyone behind, but he didn't want them to get their hands on the work. When I hear about over there, when I hear about everything that was destroyed, it... He was right to send his art. But I can never forgive him for not sending himself. Her eyes were misty with tears. He then disappeared, and I didn't hear from him again. I was mourning your father, I was taking care of you, and these paintings haunted me. I thought he was dead, and I was hurting. So I didn't think to look any deeper. This all makes sense, Ma. You shouldn't feel bad. But I do. Because I should. When the war ended, your father's brother was looking for family. Because that's what good children do. He found Grandpa. A family in a town near the camp where he had been in prison was taking care of him. A family. Not his family. Not me. Your uncle helped bring him here, and you know the rest. End quote. This floored me. This video game spin-off book about cartoon monsters has its big revelation be that one of its main characters is a Holocaust survivor. This book has teenagers drinking, it has Joey Drew being blatantly sexist, but I never expected this book to confront a topic like this so head-on. My family is Polish, and much like Buddy's grandfather, they were taken to a German labor camp. I'm not saying this in any way makes me qualified to say how tasteful this rendition of events is, but it certainly struck a chord with me personally. The delivery of this moment was emotional, and it certainly didn't leave me feeling like it was gross or exploitative. I read an excerpt so you can come to your own conclusions of how appropriate the scene is, but there's no denying that it's a bold choice and a large departure from anything in the game. 
So, to recap, this book touches on themes of sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, and the actual Holocaust tastefully and in ways that informs the characters, as well as how those characters are viewed by others. At this point, it's not just that Mike's reasoning for their lack of minority characters is misguided and inconsistent, it's that stories revolving around characters' identities have been used to great effect in this franchise. This book, approved by Mike and the Meatly, is one that perfectly shows how characters' identities and history can be a core value in writing a story. There's just two problems. The first being, who actually read this book? A poll on the Bendy subreddit revealed that over half who participated hadn't read it, and it's almost certain that that number would only grow if it had been able to reach Bendy's more casual player base. Not that you can blame anyone. Video game books are a dime a dozen, and Bendy's confusing ending may have left many unwilling to try and comprehend a novel based on something that felt so abstract. That, and with none of the creators' names on the book, may have left some with the impression that this book was less than official. That's the other problem. Kindly Beast didn't write this book. The only author credited is Adrian Kress. Their names do, however, appear on the back of the book below the synopsis. Quote, Don't miss this official, original, pulse-pounding story from award-winning author Adrian Crest, developed with the Meatly, Mike Mood, and Book Past. End quote. So, what exactly does developed mean? Well, part of the answer can be found during a Reddit AMA from Adrian and Van Oates, author of the Bendy Crack Up Comics collection. Someone did ask Adrian what the writing process was like for Dreams Come to Life, and Adrian responded, quote, It was interesting because we were really in sync from the beginning. I remember being told at the very beginning that what they wanted it to be was a young adult novel, which meant you need a teen protagonist. So I immediately thought to myself, we need an apprentice kind of character, probably in the art department just because, you know, cartoons are so visual. Then I got an email from the developer saying that that was exactly what they wanted before I even suggested it to them. So it was kind of crazy that we were already in sync and hadn't even met yet. After that, we talked about when it would be set, what was happening at the studio at the time, etc. What important facts about the Bendyverse needed to be shared. Then I created a plot outline, then they went over it and we had some phone meetings about it. We made sure that everything worked for their vision, but again, honestly, we were really on the same page literally and metaphorically. And then I wrote the book, and then they read it, offered notes, I added some things here and there. And that was kind of the process. It was amazing, honestly. I'm not sure this is as common a process for others. We just totally clicked. So, yes, there was a lot of freedom, but I also think I was given that freedom because they trusted I understood their goals and their world." End quote. This might not tell us much, but it at least shows that Kindly Beast approved details within the book or asked for certain details to be added or changed. Given Mike's comment, it would seem unlikely that him, the Meatly, or Book Past are responsible for anything regarding any character's identity, which on its own easily takes up nearly a third of the book. Something else you may have noticed is that my synopsis didn't mention any characters from the game aside from the man who the studio is named after. Another telling detail might be the book's inclusion of four brand new characters that take up most of the book's focus, and only three characters from the game having any prominent role. Had the game story been further planned out, these characters' names would have at least seen some kind of appearance prior, especially since two of them were looking for answers within the studio and one was the supervisor for the animation department. And no, I don't believe Henry coincidentally calling Boris Buddy was intentional forethought. Between the lack of writing credit, Adrian's mentioning of creative freedom in the AMA, the brand new characters, and darker themes, I feel that whatever influence Kindly Beast had on the book was minimal, beyond just general approval over the book itself, and maybe some small details to tie it back to the original game. Speaking of the AMA, there was one familiar question that went conspicuously unanswered by Adrian, and that was about the inclusion of LGBT characters in the books. Adrian's next book released was The Illusion of Living, a book seen in the game that was written by Joey Drew. It's strange to have the actual in-game book written by someone other than the people who made it for the game, but anyway. Apparently a preview of The Illusion of Living left some with the impression that Joey himself may be gay. This led to some leaving comments during Adrian's AMA, such as, Is Joey queer? and Is Joey homosexual? While other comments included, Joey gay? leading to some to reply with, Joey gay? Another individual jumped into the thread to ask, Joey gay? Before finally someone else answered, Joey gay. But only for his wallet. While ignoring these comments is one thing, 
Adrian answers multiple part questions, but doesn't answer any about Joey being gay or any LGBT characters, making not addressing these comments all the more conspicuous. Without any discernible reason as to why Adrian wouldn't confirm or deny this, some have characterized this as censorship on the part of Scholastic, since they were the ones who organized the AMA, but Scholastic has also published plenty of LGBT stories and books from authors who identify as a part of the LGBT community. But was Joey gay? No. Yes, it's not explicitly told one way or the other. An example is Joey's disinterest in women, which Joey claims is due to him not finding the time. Others point to Joey's fascination with talented men such as Sammy, though Joey has that same fascination with talent in Dreams Come to Life when shown Buddy's drawings. Dreamfisher, a bendy analyst who I've followed for a while, made a series of posts explaining why they believe Joey is queer-coded, including references to gay culture from the 30s and 40s. They make a strong case, though regardless, I believe, much like the reply from earlier, that Joey's interests lie more in power and money than they do with any man or woman. Still, I'm not the one who makes that final call, and Adrian is quite content with fan interpretation. During the AMA, some said they believe Joey may have ADHD due to his shifting focus. Adrian replied, quote, I didn't personally have that thought, though I do think it's an interesting way to see him. I think the great thing, though, about art is that we see ourselves in something regardless of creator intent. End quote. And I think that's a wonderful sentiment. Maybe Joey being gay was a surprise they wanted to keep for the book's release, or maybe it was more accidental. Either way you see it is valid, though hopefully you don't see too much of yourself in Joey Drew of all people, because it's clear where that road leads. So yeah, the books are good. While I won't recommend supporting Kindly Beast, I think it says a lot that the best installment in a video game franchise that they created is a book that they didn't write. That then brings us back to the story of Bendy and the Ink Machine. A story without a story. Even if it wasn't planned, at least the concrete story beats are wholly original and innovative as Mike claims they aspire to. Right? Well, let's talk about Bioshock. Bioshock may be a game that you've been familiar with for years, and so the similarities between it and Bendy were something felt immediately when playing. On the other hand, you may not have played or even heard much of Bioshock, especially since the last installment in the franchise was nearly a decade ago. I say that because I didn't play any of the games until 2020 when they were released for the Switch. Even then, part of the reason I bought it was because I had heard so many claims that it shares a lot of similarities with Bendy. If you're not aware, Bioshock was a first-person shooter released in 2007. You play as some guy whose plane crashes and finds his way into the underwater city of Rapture, a utopia that has fallen into a civil war. Despite being categorized as a first-person shooter, the game carries a surprising amount of depth in both its gameplay as well as its narrative. Bioshock sold millions of copies and received plenty of critical acclaim. The game's influence is something felt in gaming to this day, which is what brings us back to Bendy. It's no secret that Mike and the Meatly are Bioshock fans. The Meatly has made a few comics about Bioshock, and in a video listing his top 15 favorite games, it was even ranked second on the list and cited as the Meatly's inspiration for getting into game design. Bioshock changed everything for me. It's the reason I got into game design myself. I played the demo for Bioshock before it got released. Like many of you out there, I was never the same again. I got lost in Rapture and have never really come back since. In fact, Games are still copying Bioshock's formula to this day. I did also enjoy Bioshock 2. Likewise, Bioshock Infinite was absolutely amazing, but to be honest, still Bioshock 1 will always be my personal favorite in the series. It is just an amazing game. Finally, in an interview with Game Reactor, Mike said, quote, The majority of our team are big Bioshock fans, so yes, lots of inspiration from Bioshock. Lots of our visuals, the concept of dripping ink, water everywhere, and of course the time period." End quote. Point being, it's clear that most parallels that can be found between Bendy and Bioshock are more than a coincidence. And it's fine if you want to take inspiration from other works, but when your game's unplayable state is excused by your innovative story, then it's worth asking the question, how deep do these parallels go? Well, 
I was actually planning on doing a Bioshock video next, and given how much time I spent playing Bendy, I decided to look for myself, and over time, the narrative similarities began to stack up. A smooth-talking entrepreneur who cares only for himself creates a place that falls into ruin as he becomes more reclusive and secretive, even to those closest to him. The protagonist, who is effectively an outsider, enters said place and becomes trapped inside, encountering transformed humans, most of which have gone insane and are incredibly hostile. The founder is placed as the game's antagonist, whose stories of manipulation and ambition are told through audio logs. Bioshock a deformed human with glowing lights for eyes who is protecting a valuable organic resource found within other creatures, which the player needs to retrieve. Bioshock. Interacting with food objects has the player just scarf it down, regaining any lost health. Bioshock. Flashing images. Bioshock. Ghostly visions. Bioshock. The player walks into a room where they see the game's iconic monster walking down an adjacent hallway, unaware or uncaring of the player's presence. Bioshock. A woman invites the player into her base of operations, the player views a cutscene of her behind a pane of glass, and then the player is sent off on a fetch quest in a new area of the game. Bioshock. A masked man jumps the player, rendering them unconscious. The player then wakes up restrained, and the masked man then monologues to the player before leaving, allowing the protagonist to free themselves. Bioshock. The player walks past a bunch of still, human-like figures, and interacts with an object before turning around and seeing the figures have disappeared. Bioshock. A paranoid character has the player retrieve items for them to place into a receptacle, and seemingly keeps their word before betraying them. Bioshock. The player encounters a character who was betrayed by the founder, went insane, and is now willing to do cruel things to achieve their perfect vision. The self-centered visionary's introduction has them looking to test the player, expressing this using insect metaphors. Once they venture into their territory, the player is greeted with them tormenting someone who they believe to be lesser or unworthy. The Visionary then promises that after the player completes a series of tasks for them, they'll let them go. They then unlock access to a new, enemy-infested area of the game that the player will then have to explore to complete a series of tasks for them. The player is able to take care of smaller enemies by having them encounter the game's iconic monster, who dispatches those same enemies with ease. In the middle of their tasks, the player is then suddenly forced to fight off a horde of enemies. The Visionary also teases the player with something that they are unable to have. Bioshock, Bioshock, Bioshock. It's not just the first game either. The other Bioshock games also share some similarities with Bendy. Some of these are spoilers, so bear with me. The player has to find their way to a pump control system in order to drain a blocked passage. This leads them to venture into the territory of a man who has begun a cult, one dedicated to someone who is actually not worth worshipping. The player briefly sees the cultist at the start of the level, finds audio logs of his beliefs, as well as ones from people who mention his strange behavior. This segment of the game builds to the player coming face to face with the cultist in the place where they perform rituals. Bioshock 2. An ally is kidnapped by a woman who transforms them into a monster that the player is then forced to kill while taunted by the woman who wishes to see you both suffer. Bioshock 2. The game's ending has the player go through a door to discover the constant loop they're being forced through. Bioshock Infinite. A recurring three digit number in the game that has no explicit correlation between events. Bioshock Infinite. Now, one or two of these would be a coincidence, and I'm willing to bet that a couple of them still are. But these aren't technical things like a first-person perspective, circular crosshair, or the inclusion of a Tommy gun. These are oddly specific details that take up a substantial portion of the game. This also isn't meant to say that Bendy ripped off Bioshock and that 2K is going to sue Kindly Beast into oblivion. Legally speaking, as someone who isn't a gaming copyright lawyer, as long as the game was made from the ground up and doesn't share any assets or names with Bioshock directly, then there's no realistic chance of the game being taken down or Kindly Beast being sued. Ethically speaking, it's also just okay to use concepts from elsewhere. In fact, the creative director of Bioshock actively encourages it. Somebody's gonna come along and make some awesome first-person shooter take an idea out of that that you're gonna love, but they're gonna steal an idea out of that and they're gonna turn it into something that maybe is more to your taste. And I, you know, I steal ideas from everywhere I see, from really strange things you would never expect. And I think that's the value, even to a guy like you, is, is you're, there's going to be an idea that you're going to love someday, that you're going to have no idea comes from some guy living in his mom's basement, you know, writing poetry. The problem is that copying is not inherently innovative. When your reason for ensuring that your games are playable is due to your focus on innovating through your story and characters, then there should be more to your game than just emulating what another game had to offer a decade ago. 
At the very least, the ideas copied should hold the same level of thought as the original, or at least given context that makes the use of those ideas distinct from what's come before. Unfortunately, what should make Bendy different is the context of these events within the story, but when there's not been a lot of thought put into these characters and the story hasn't been planned, then there's nothing to directly point to that makes their version of events distinct. In fact, because Bendy doesn't present a coherent reason for events that it shares with Bioshock, then it seems all the more likely that they may have used certain ideas for the sole purpose of just scaring the player or adding on a layer of mystery, rather than for a reason that coherently applies to the narrative. The easiest examples to look to are the use of flashing images and ghostly visions. By the end of the game, at no point is it explained why those flashing images appeared at Chapter 1, or what they meant, and why Henry has ghostly hallucinations. Given that the first appearance of those visions occurs in Chapter 4, which was developed in tandem with Chapter 5, the lack of an explanation is all the more perplexing. Bioshock has a reason for each that is unambiguously explained to the player, and the reasoning for those events are tied to either the plot or the purpose of world building. After the game has explained what they are, and the player has seen enough ghostly visions to where they're probably no longer unnerved or surprised by them, they pretty much appear from time to time just to act as easy exposition. Meanwhile, Bendy has them happen twice for the sake of scaring the player, once during a cool fight scene, and once at the very end of the game without any express purpose or reason. Without presenting any reason that differs these events from Bioshock, it's hard to say that the use of them was a coincidence. When using someone else's idea, it should feel as though it has more purpose behind it than, wouldn't it be scary if we used this? Say it's Henry's sanity, say it's the Ink Machine's supernatural powers, say it's all a dream that's becoming less coherent, but say something so that it makes your use of it different from the original. Another key difference is in how Bioshock treats its characters. Characters in Bioshock have a history, motivations, and a viewpoint on both the success and failure of Rapture. In fact, Bioshock's characters are also certain races and religions, mention certain historical events like the German labor camps, and even have racism play a role in how some characters view and treat each other. Bioshock works so well in part because you know almost exactly how and why key events unfold. A comparison that covers the characters, narrative, and the innovations made can be seen in comparing Chapter 3 of Bendy to Bioshock's Fort Frolic. Given that Mike said that their only plan for Chapter 3 was to include more Alice Angel, it feels as though they decided to just make their own version of Fort Frolic. But again, there are some important things missing from Chapter 3 for its story to even come close to matching Fort Frolic, and that's in its expectations, choices, and themes. First, expectations. In Bendy, after finishing her tasks, Alice, the psychotic, murderous, self-centered visionary, betrays the player, and the chapter ends. This probably didn't come as much of a surprise. Alice hasn't exactly shown much kindness throughout your time with her, and with two chapters left in the game, clearly the game isn't going to just let you reach the surface. In Bioshock, after finishing his tasks, Sander Cohen, the psychotic, murderous, self-centered visionary, keeps his word and just lets the player go. There's no one last thing to do, he doesn't attempt to dispose of the player now that the checklist is complete, and there isn't even some kind of boss fight to complete in order to leave. Not only that, he rewards the player for their help by giving them a tonic that increases the effectiveness of medkits. Cohen may be psychotic, but it shows that there's still some kind of methodology to his madness. He then proceeds to explain that if the player had proved themselves a true disciple, they could have seen into his muse box. This is where choice comes into play. A good way to innovate in any video game story is to give the player a choice. Video games are interactive, after all. Some can be small, while others can affect what ending the player gets. As long as the choice presented at least holds some kind of gameplay or narrative consequence, it can cause the player to think about their actions and engage more with what's going on. In Bioshock, after you've finished your work with Sander Cohen, you can leave, and you'll see Cohen later in his apartment, continuing his work, or you can attack Cohen, get the key, and loot his muse box. There's no prompt, but at this point, the game's made it clear that if they're not behind glass and not in a cutscene, they almost definitely can be killed. The game doesn't just have Cohen not betray you, but it actually gives you the option to betray him in this instance. The choice is relatively small, but it's an optional boss fight with someone who's been bossing you around this whole time, even sending his goons after you out of paranoia, and the reward is one of his most valued possessions. Or you can feel he's probably not worth the trouble, maybe even pity the man, and just go on your way. 
Meanwhile, the only choice in Chapter 3 is which of the two labeled rooms to go in, and while the choice is clearly communicated to the player, the only thing it ultimately affects is whether or not you're eligible for the possibility of unlocking the Tommy Gun, which you can only get if you don't die at any point, and the bowl of ink in the toy machine room is in the shape of the ink machine. Then after you get the ink hearts, Henry just gives it back apparently. It's the only real choice in the whole game, and that's how much it matters. No influence on events, just a chance for a part of the fetch quest that's made a little easier. I think an interesting way to fix this problem with Chapter 3 specifically would be to have the option to just ignore Alice entirely and let the player find what they need to override the elevator. Blueprints, tools, and materials found throughout the same area as the Alice fetch quests. Maybe Alice becomes frustrated when ignored, turning off the lights at times to make navigation more challenging, or making noise in areas the player is in to try and have Bendy attack them. Chapters 2 and 3 are primarily fetch quests anyway, so it wouldn't be that taxing of a development cost. In the end, the events could still even lead to Chapter 4. Overriding the elevator fails, it falls with Henry and Boris inside, and Alice kidnaps Boris. Even then, the choice still affects the events in Chapter 3 and Henry's dynamic with Alice. It might not be much, but it would not only differ Chapter 3 from Fort Frolic, it would also technically be innovating the framework used. That idea is free, by the way. Kindly Beast has to credit me, but anyone else can use it for free. Finally, themes. If you choose to attack Cohen, then his death also fits thematically, since his whole shtick has been killing all these people for his art. It might even be exactly what he would want a true disciple to do, add him to his own creation. If that's the case, then you've earned the right to look in his muse box. Meanwhile, Alice's death a chapter later comes out of nowhere and is used as a cliffhanger for the reveal of the new Alice and Tom. Her death narratively means next to nothing, especially when it's by the hands of characters that we don't know and who didn't just have to go through her sick games. When looking at it thematically, even the most generous analysis reveals symbolism that's almost mean-spirited. Susie was the voice actress for Alice Angel before suddenly being replaced by a woman named Allison. Susie became the Alice in Chapter 3, and Allison became the Alice seen stabbing her at the end of Chapter 4. Susie was stabbed in the heart by Joey's betrayal and stabbed in the back by Joey when replacing her with Allison without even telling her. Now Allison kills her by doing both, but unlike the last time this happened to Susie, Henry is there, and he... just watches it happen. So, I guess it doesn't matter that Henry left. Him being there wouldn't have changed anything. I've looked at this scene countless times, and this is legitimately the best interpretation I've been able to come up with. It feels as intentionally confusing as the ending itself, and it feels too mean-spirited to be the case. The problem is not that Kindly Beast tried to copy Bioshock. It's that they didn't even copy all of Bioshock. It's not just the framework that makes Bioshock's narrative special, but the arcs and themes. And that's just to properly copy Bioshock. To innovate would mean at least changing these details in a way that's engaging. But, as it stands, it would seem the greatest innovation of Bendy would be its use of an art style that'll probably age better than Bioshock's realistic graphics, and even then, the sketching-like, hand-drawn art style can be seen in segments of the Bioshock Infinite DLC. Some of this might have felt nitpicky, but I do want to make it clear that not every little thing that's in Bendy, even if it was directly taken from Bioshock, is a bad thing. Mike never tried to excuse their game's unplayable state by boasting about the innovative gameplay. And things like audio logs and a glowing effect on interactive objects ultimately benefit the player in ways that are hard to innovate upon. Not only that, but Bendy also has fun, original ideas. The fight between the projectionist and Bendy is one that comes to mind. Those kinds of events make the world seem lived in, with pre-existing tension between characters. That event doesn't feel like it was triggered by the player, but that Bendy was going to attack the projectionist anyway, and it happened to be to our advantage. I also just like the concept of the projectionist. Characters with TV heads are a dime a dozen, but to use that concept in a different era is a neat idea. It's just a shame they didn't utilize him as much as they could have. Finally, the game is also able to use concepts seen in the Bioshock franchise, but in ways that make it distinct. In Bioshock 2 and Bendy Chapter 4, the player has to traverse an abandoned theme park with a railcar attraction, and the player's objective when they arrive is to find a way inside. The main difference is in how each is executed once the player is inside the attraction. 
Bioshock 2's ride is all propaganda for children, talking about how terrible the surface world is compared to the utopia that is Rapture. The ride is also broken down, so the player has to traverse it on foot. Bendy's ride is a haunted house, but the ride is fully functional, so the player is able to sit back and enjoy the ride. Similar in concept, but distinct in their execution. Kindly Beast has the capacity to make original ideas, or innovate on one scene elsewhere. But even now, what we've seen of Benny and the Dark Revival has the game following closely behind Bioshock and its subsequent sequel, which went from venturing into the game's setting with an outsider, to now following the events of a new Denizen character, while also expanding the player's abilities. Even having the Aaron sweater wearing player character's weapon in their right hand, and special powers on their left. Time will tell if this time Kindly Beast will innovate through their stories and characters, but their track record indicates otherwise. It's also strange to think that Kindly Beast takes down fan games who use their name, but I've seen fan games with less in common with the original than what Bendy shares with Bioshock. In some ways, Bendy might just be the only Bioshock fan game to see a commercial release. Ultimately, their reasoning for not developing their games with quality in mind doesn't justify it. And even if the game had been as fresh and innovative as possible, all that work would go to waste if the player isn't even able to start the game let alone finish the story as envisioned. It doesn't matter how good a game's story is if nobody is able to play it. So, how does the Meatly feel about taking concepts from another game and using it as their own? Well, let's talk about the Meatly, his comics, and Fortnite. <laughs> Some have wondered what exactly the Meatly's place in this situation is, and understandably so, given that he is the co-founder of Kindly Beast and a member of the board that has been mentioned in ex-employee reviews. And I want to make his place in this abundantly clear. As a member of the board, the Meatly has been responsible for many of the decisions made. He was one of the directors who made the unanimous decision to fire employees without notice. He was either ignorant or complacent with any employee abuse, is responsible for the company's mismanagement, and is, at the very least, aware that they have been dishonest about their games. The Meatly has not been accused of workplace abuse, but he's still a member of the board and there's a lot that's gone unanswered. Maybe he was ignorant to all of it, and maybe not. But without any word from him, there's no way of knowing. And that's one of the biggest problems. The Meatly silence on the controversy has meant no allegations regarding him have been disputed or clarified, and that a substantial portion of his audience are probably unaware that this controversy exists at all. And that's likely intentional. On October 11th, 2019, the day the mass firings took place, the Meatly only made one tweet, replying to someone regarding their choice of Halloween costume. After that, tweets from him were scarce until Halloween, at which point it appeared to be business as usual. Regular tweets, late night polls, and Bendy promotions, though Showdown Bandit was never mentioned again. Despite the silence, it is still possible to look retroactively at the Meatly's work and at least see how the Meatly has felt about certain topics in this controversy, particularly through his comics. One such example has the Meatly working at a desk when an executive decides that their game should have multiplayer, since co-op games sell so well, and that the Meatly should work out something by tomorrow before the executive excuses himself for the night, leaving the Meatly to try and figure it out himself. Quote, Whew, it's hard making the tough decisions. And I've got dinner reservations, so... End quote. Another comic of note has the Meatly at the head of a table in a meeting with other developers, planning on working on a game together before it all falls into chaos only an hour later. Most of the Meatly's comics age poorly because the position of the deceptive or unempathetic executive could now be swapped with the Meatly himself being in that role. But given the allegations of lack of direction from the board and sense of instability prominent throughout the Kindly Beast studio, this comic isn't so much ironic as it is foreboding of the events that would follow. With comics that have aged so poorly, it might be considered incredible that they're even available on the Meatly's own website, but it's gone one step further. In November of 2020, the Meatly created a Twitter account called Club Meatly, where every few days, the Meatly posts one of his comics. As you may have guessed, both of the comics I mentioned have been posted by this account. What some may not realize is that these are all older comics the Meatly made prior to Bendy's success, which kind of explains the Pokemon Go and Candy Crush references. However, despite the limited number of comics, the account has remained active for nearly a year. Though it's reached a point where the account is now posting comics that have already been posted, sometimes with the same caption. What's somehow more bizarre is the creation of hashtag Meatly Meme, featuring gifs of the Meatly and this... sock puppet thing, 
as well as hashtag meatcake featuring a muscular meatly. While the general consensus appeared to be one of feeling disturbed, this also led to some concerning comments. As for topics such as creativity and the games industry, the Meatly has been no stranger to satirizing both, sometimes in the same comic. An example comes when covering the topic of originality. In it, the Downfish, a character that embodies self-doubt, says there are no more original ideas, and when presented with the Meatly's new idea, the Downfish responds by saying, quote, It's original, but it still reminds me of something I've seen before. You thief. End quote. The message in this comic is clear. Just because something is reminiscent of something else, doesn't mean the idea can't still be original. Another comic similarly covers originality, though the message appears to be very different. This time, the Meatly encounters someone who claims the game they made is a tribute to their favorite game, but clearly is a little more than that. Quote, Sure, I use their art, their gameplay, and their story, but it's totally an original game. End quote. The comic ends with the Meatly noting that the game has sold over 5,000 copies. The message here appears to be that paying tribute to your favorite game by lifting a bunch of elements from it and then calling it original is wrong, but it can certainly pay well. This comic was released less than a year before Chapter 1 of Bendy, and given the various ideas lifted from Bioshock, one is left to wonder if the Meatly stance on such tribute games changed, or if he simply decided to join them. The Meatly stance on originality becomes even more muddied with his recent tweets. And this is where Fortnite, the popular online battle royale game, comes into play. In March of 2021, Fortnite released the Chapter 2 Season 6 Battle Pass. In it, players could earn cosmetics including a banner icon featuring a cartoonish black and white rendition of the Meowsles character, and a spray design that depicted a cartoonish scuffle between a cartoon Meowsles, the banana character Peely, and the fish character Fishsticks. Some thought a collaboration between Bendy and Fortnite was on the horizon. However, when brought to the Meatly's attention, all he had to say was, quote, I mean, they could have asked if we want to collaborate. Hashtag Bendy. End quote. Then in April, Fortnite announced the release of their outfit called Grimy, a black, inky creature sporting a toothy grin. The Meatly quote tweeted a teaser of the skin saying, quote, So, it's really starting to seem like they wanted hashtag Bendy to be a part of their game, but they didn't want to just come and ask us? We could have talked about this at Fortnite game. We could have talked about this. End quote. Then in May, Fortnite released a short comic teasing the release of a toon version of the Meowsel skin. The comic featured the character eating a monochromatic cartoon fish before being consumed by what appeared to be ink, giving the character a more cartoon-like appearance. The Meatly once again quote tweeted saying, quote, How familiar. Nope, we didn't invent ink or rubber hose, but pretty sure that scary ink turning people into cartoon versions sounds pretty hashtag bendy to me. As always, I wish at Fortnite Game and their players nothing but luck and happiness. End quote. None of these tweets were received very well by fans or critics, but the memes were pretty good. While some thought Kindly Beast may actually pursue legal action, no such lawsuit has been made public. Lawsuit or not, it's easy to see how the Meatly stance on originality and creative freedom appears to waver. He felt like a concept reminding someone of something similar was a bit ridiculous, but proceeded to call out Fortnite for using a concept reminiscent of Bendy, though his game arguably did the same with Bioshock. Once again, the silence makes this all the more frustrating. Without a response, it would seem the Meatly himself is less of an individual and more of a corporate brand. It's hard to sympathize with someone who's been dishonest and in the face of criticism, carries on as though there's nothing to answer for. Silence won't stop a story from being told. It only changes whether or not you get to tell your side of it. And that takes us to the ex-employee interviews. Before I begin, I want to give some greater context regarding these interviews. First, I want to be clear that you don't have to believe anything of what is about to be said. There is more than enough publicly accessible and transparent information out there to confidently hold Kindly Beast and its leaders accountable for. After that, I want to explain a little of these sources. There's a distinction to be made between anonymous sources and sources that wish to remain anonymous. The individuals I interviewed were able to prove their affiliation to Kindly Beast, but wished to remain anonymous in the publication. This one might sound obvious, but I won't be sharing any of the names or details that were requested to remain anonymous. That sounds obvious, I know, but trust in this case is incredibly important, 
and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to ask questions directly to ex-employees or share it publicly had I not agreed to keep them anonymous. I appreciate them for doing so, and for trusting me, so respecting them and the arrangement is the very least I can do. A lot of this video has had a fair share of editing to hopefully make the situation easier to understand. Since this video is the source for all of the following information, I don't want to dramatize it. This video is about the controversy in its entirety, not just exaggerating the worst parts. Since there's nowhere else to view these responses, aside from a link in the description, then I've abridged very little in every interview, if at all. This video is long enough already, but this is where I feel giving the full context is crucial. There aren't going to be a lot of flashy visuals or audio stingers that I may have used in previous segments, because, as the source of this information, I don't want it to seem like I'm trying to frame what they have to say with my own bias. I'm also not a voice actor, nor am I able to know for sure what tone each statement was meant to be read with, so I'm just giving it the tone I felt was appropriate while I was reading it. Finally, let's talk about formatting. To help make things easier to understand, I asked every ex-employee to answer similar questions, and I would follow up with additional questions should any arise over time or from their initial responses. So. Let's start with employee number one. Just to clarify, is there a specific role, position, or department you specialized in during your time at Kindly Beast? Would you say you worked more so on the Kindly Beast side of things, or Joey Drew Studios? I'd say I was more so a member of Kindly Beast, working on Showdown Bandit. To start things off on a lighthearted note, what was with the coffee machine? What made the coffee so good? How do you feel about Bendy Blend, Kindly Beast's Bendy branded coffee blend, given the company's reputation? That's the first I've heard of Bendy Blend. This is ridiculous. I guess they're trying to cash in? Is it a passive-aggressive thing towards ex-employees? I don't know. The coffee was good. I don't know if it was mind-blowing, but we liked our coffee machine. I feel like it just became a ridiculous meme that the coffee was great after someone said that. Like, it's just really funny to weigh the crap they put us through in the cons of Glassdoor reviews against the pros of good coffee. We were pretty dependent on it, though, and if I remember correctly, the guy who serviced and restocked it only did it as a part-time job. So sometimes the machine would be out of beans, and people would get pretty cranky. It was also pretty loud, and once or twice, someone who wasn't thinking would start making a coffee at the start of an all-staff meeting, leading to some pretty funny moments of everyone just staring at the person in question until their coffee was done brewing. Is there a reason that you specifically have been so quiet about things? Has it been for the sake of moving on, or has there been a pressure to keep quiet? There is definitely worry that lawsuits could be filed. I don't think they have a bias in reality, but it could certainly be a huge hassle. Trying to move on is part of it too. I generally don't want to live in the past, hold on to negativity, or be publicly raging. The latter is also just a question of professionalism to some degree. Would you say the anonymous employees on Reddit and Glassdoor are credible, or would you happen to know for a fact that they were written by ex-employees? Not looking for names if you're not wanting to give them, I just want to know if what little info exists is accurate slash genuine. Everything I've seen on Glassdoor is credible. In some cases, I do know for sure they were written by ex-employees. Most of the Reddit stuff I've seen is also credible, although there is some pretty salacious stuff about Cricket that I hope isn't anyone from Kindly Beast. Because it was gross and bad, and no one deserves to be harassed in that way. I don't know about the possible relationship, but there was a bunch of stuff that just took the speculation there way too far. And then just outright harassment. I like to think that everyone I worked with at Kindly Beast was better than that. Alright, I'd like to now talk about your time employed at Kindly Beast. What was day-to-day -day life like? Was there a pattern, or were things constantly in flux? It changed a lot over time, but one constant was that they never explained themselves. You have to justify some of your decisions to the people you work with. They were running the company, but absent. Then they'd come in and just play the I'm your boss card. At first, I think they held everyone's respect, but doing that over and over, and also giving inconsistent feedback and bad direction, they lost people. If you always use, because I told you so, people may continue to follow your orders, but unless you deliver anything solid, you'll lose their respect. That was my perspective anyways. I started off really respecting their work, and the idea of the company they wanted to make. 
But over time, they just got more and more pushy, let more and more distance form between themselves and the rest of the company, were not forthcoming or honest with their feedback, didn't want any ideas or criticism of their direction. It felt more and more like they lucked into success, and their management style was terrible. On some level, I do get some of their troubles, I think. Like, they came back after the showdown debacle and tried to work on Benny the Dark Revival with the team, but they still treated everyone like, just follow our lead, not trying to listen or understand. There was a final push where Mike and Meatly showed up, just for a couple of days as I recall, to work on Benny the Dark Revival with the team. But they weren't really working with the team. They were just showing the team how they worked as a two-man operation and downplaying the team's work. The fact that they only lasted two days speaks to a lack of real effort to bridge the gap. They had all these people's jobs on the line, and that was the best they could do. If I can muster any sympathy there, I would say that that would be a hard position to be in. Speaking to a group you've already lost and not knowing how to build trust back up, not knowing how to address that divide, once you've lost credibility and people are just there because they're worried their work is going to be thrown out and maybe they'll be out of a job soon, that's not going to be great for the leaders either, especially leaders without a lot of experience. I also think some of the Kindly Beast team from before the company started growing fast were not super happy with the new process and team size. So there was some dissatisfaction and desire to return to the indie feeling from before, and that's fair enough, those things are hard to manage. Again, the fate of the company and all the people working there was hanging in the balance. You might think they would try harder to get over themselves and find some new way to make this work, especially after repeatedly making those promises to not throw out work, to work with the team, to keep everyone's job safe, but no. One thing I want to stress is that while a lot of blame was put on VPs and leads, Mood and Meatly were having trouble getting things from people throughout my time at the company. My understanding is that, even before growing, they just couldn't get even a small team to work together to produce anything. What was the communication between the board and the team like? For example, were they hands-on regarding certain areas of Showdown Bandit, but ignoring Bendy and the Dark Revival, or vice versa, or were they focused on the look of both games rather than the gameplay? They didn't tell anyone what their problems were, or what their vision really looked like. From the outset, they definitely misrepresented what the situation was, in terms of the team's creative freedom, and maybe even business objectives and what the nature of the merch deals was. I'll never know what parts were deliberate lies told to us, or just mistakes they made along the way. There's not much to gain from lying about some of this. It seems more likely that they really thought they could hand the project off. They probably believed what they were saying. Or maybe not. There was never a conversation from them about this. Although Mood has misrepresented it on Reddit. I don't know if he's lying or in his mind he's retconned what happened. Was there anything particularly weird that was required of you or anyone else? I assume there were no daily blood sacrifices, but I suppose I won't know until I ask. Haha, <laughs> no. From early on, I noticed some weird politics within the core group. That should have been a bigger red flag for me, but I can't comment about that. I failed to ever bring it up past encouraging people to talk to each other, and it wasn't my place, so I'll reserve further comment on that. One thing I really didn't like about how the Meatly operated was making things into tests. Instead of just giving people feedback, he would have ideas about things that could be done, and if you didn't magically make the same decisions he did, he would just quietly hold that as a mark against your ability to perform. So not a weird requirement of working there, but rather very particular ideas that would deliberately not be shared. Did any of the directors display any anti-diversity behavior? Mike has a reputation of being a Gamergate supporter and claims to not have LGBTQ representation in their games because their characters are not defined by what they identify as. I honestly can't say there was. I know that was something in Mike's past, but he was incredulous that people were holding that against him when he was going out of his way to do diverse hiring and I think even some charitable donations to social justice-oriented causes. I won't villainize him for things I didn't see, and I didn't see any of that. Did any of the board have anything against other game devs in the area? I know Mike has feelings about Dirty Rectangles and Scott Cawthon, but did he ever say or do anything to reinforce those feelings? And did this mean that some places slash topic conversations were not allowed? Nothing came up at the time I was working there. From my perspective, the rift between folks in the Ottawa game dev community and Mike got really bad after the mass firing. Did you or any other ex-employees have problems with Sin, as HR or as a person? 
Sin was another person I thought I had a good relationship with while I was there. She was very friendly. It was almost like she became a completely different person after the mass firings. The stuff she started posting on social media was the height of unprofessionalism. I guess she felt she had to defend her brother. I don't know. Pretty insane stuff from her actual account, and some other things that I think came from her, but are unconfirmed. They went out of their way to attack people, even when ex-employees were mostly being pretty quiet. It was kicking the hornet's nest. So unnecessary. I feel like this probably caused more Glassdoor reviews to be posted. Did you or any other ex-employees have or had problems with Foxygen? And is there any credibility to her having an affair with Mike? After what I've seen, I don't believe so, but that's just based on what's been made public. Cricket was never anything but nice to me. I don't know about her relationship with Mike, other than saying they were good friends before she was hired. I heard other people saying she was spying on us for Mike, and I know people in the community had complaints with her moderation. But as I said before, she really doesn't deserve the harassment she's had to put up with. On the subject of community, I'll say I found it surprising how great the Benny community was. Lots of good people. Not a lot of gross stuff happening before all this went down. I'm sad that what seemed like a lot of good people online are now split because of this whole Kindly Beast debacle. I don't think I would prefer that people keep the blinders on and worship Mike Mood in the Meatly, but I hate that it's probably caused a lot of grief for a fandom that, for all the inky darkness, seemed pretty wholesome when I first joined. Can you recall any specific instances of abuse in the workplace? Mike Mood swings, threats, etc.? I use Mike as an example because he's the one with the public allegations of abuse. I wasn't personally present for the worst of it. What I saw was a lot of being very dismissive of people's work, and towards the end just worse and worse conflicting feedback, just being super rude while offering very little to constructively improve anything. But I also know he called people into meetings or had phone calls where he blew up and threatened people about various things. I have heard threats of legal action to stop people from speaking out. The thing that was super constant with Mike and Meatly was dishonesty. In retrospect, nothing added up. They were constantly saying conflicting things about our work, company health, goals with the games, all of it. Were the Meatly and BookPass complicit in Mike's behavior? Well, they were equal partners and did nothing to stop it. They were super nice to me to my face, but obviously had huge problems with my team's work and mine in particular. From what I heard, Meatly was pretty bad to some of the senior people on Dark Revival. Mike and Meatly were partners in crime, seeming to come to all the major decisions together. On the other hand, they were not always very respectful of each other when addressing employees and the other party was not around. I'll also say this about all three of them. They brought me on talking about building a company that felt like family. They acted like this company was going to be super indie and everyone was friends. Then they were allegedly just too busy to be present, and I honestly found that disappointing. Then they threw out all my work on a project I cared so deeply about, and that was brutal. I tried to fall in line and get behind their vision, even as they failed to provide any clarity of what that was, and in the end, they fired me with everyone else without a word of explanation. Nothing. Just sent in sin to tell everyone we were done. Minimum severance. That's not the right way to run a company, much less treat your family. I've been through other layoffs and company closures, but never anything like this. Not knowing what you did wrong, if you even did something wrong, it's so hard. And part of me thinks they wanted to make it sting. We wanted to make great games, but they really wanted us to validate their genius. And for not doing that, we were shut out. You can point to the Reddit AMA train wreck and say Mike apologized and explained there, but for various reasons, I personally didn't find that very credible. It hurts to be let go from any job for any reason, more so when you're a passionate game developer, I think, where your job is probably a big part of your identity. Having that taken away, and not even being told why, that's crushing. They can say there were complex legal reasons they couldn't say anything, but to me it felt more like they didn't want to say anything to make it better because they didn't want to minimize the impact. Their silence was the message. Did Mike frequently use legal action as a means to an end, for employees or outside issues, when you were employed there? Has he threatened legal action since you were let go? As I said before, I know it was threatened, both to individuals and, near the end, addressing the entire company. The last thing addressed to me was the NDA to not talk about anything that happened, which everyone got when they were fired. For most people, it was accompanied with an offer to pay a bit of extra severance, arguably only what was due in some cases, I thought. But for me, there was zero additional money. 
It also came with the offer for Optimum Talent to help, but like I said, I had another job, so that was a non-issue. So I never signed that NDA. After the firings, you'll notice that some people took to social media to talk publicly about this, and some of those tweets disappeared. My suspicion, and I wouldn't want to get anyone back into legal trouble by discussing anything more than suspicion, but let's say a strong belief, is that in those cases, people were threatened with legal action. When the VPs were fired, do you know slash feel that this was due to them not adhering to the board's vision, or was there a different reason? like the beginning of the firings in a staggered fashion to avoid mass termination. I know that the dodging the legal requirements for mass termination thing has been speculated. Possibly. That could have also been the reason they kept employees on sick leave around a little longer. I never felt like I got the full story here, though, even from VPs. I would guess some sort of contractual or legal concern has kept them quiet. But in terms of why, really, I could only speculate. My gut feeling is that the board knew many employees looked up to and respected the VPs at a time when people were losing faith in them. Mike and Meatly were very absent during this period, showed up only to message crazy-sounding pivots in company direction. So, yeah, difference in vision, but maybe also frustration that the VP layer was providing leadership in a transparent and accountable style, where the board at that point seemed to be all about shut up and do what we say. I think the VPs were in a bit of a tough spot, because they were being asked to sell a message from the board they didn't believe in. But then I've also heard, and I don't even remember where now, but Mood seemed to be implying they were spending too much money and other crazy allegations. So he either believed some weird stuff, or was making up things about them related to other issues. I cannot imagine that the VPs were doing anything objectionable like that. At the end of the day, the board didn't really offer an explanation of any sort, so who knows. I'm curious how the board felt about their products. Bendy, for example, has had the lore change a few times, and get it done good enough doesn't exactly sound like the words of someone who cares about what they're making as long as it's done. Do you know if there was anything in particular the board was truly passionate about, or was it all just a product to them? Was Showdown Bandit and or Benny and the Dark Revival a painful trial and error built game with no direction because the board kept shooting things down while not being involved? I absolutely think that there's credit that's due for Showdown Bandit in terms of the models, sound effects, and a few other details, but I didn't know if any of the board or vice producers were, slash should have been, overseeing the project specifically. Their motivation and attitude changed constantly. At times, it seemed like there was such pride in their work. They celebrated cool ideas and bits of things coming together. It seemed like genuine enthusiasm. But then things started to get less clear. At first it was, let's make some cool games, but then the emphasis would shift to selling merch. Some days they would say it was all just an ad for merch. And the target audience kept shifting. How much it was for us versus for pretty young kids versus specific content creators was always changing. I don't know if I'd say the whole thing was trial and error. It was an experimental game on a short timeline. Then as we got closer to the date, Mood and Meatly started to demand changes. The team was trying to figure out what they wanted, but it was impossible to please them. Mood and Meatly sort of halfway tried to provide leadership, but it was a mess. They would change their minds, give inconsistent feedback, or make impossible demands. The lack of ability to manage a team was really apparent here. They also loved their own work and made all sorts of excuses for things they would have called the larger team out for doing. It was a huge double standard. They just thought everything they did was great and everything the team did was below their greatness. It came across sometimes in what they said directly, but other times in the condescending attitude. Meatly can make things pretty, I'll grant that. I think some of the artists probably had differing opinions on that, felt there were places we could improve, but either way, Game design and programming are not areas Mood and Meatly excelled, and they were not very interested in hearing the nuances of why solutions to complex problems were necessary. Once again, trying to be charitable and objective, I could see where they were coming from in some cases. Here was the core issue. They said they wanted to make bigger, better games, but then it was hard to solve problems that came along with that. So they would always just want to drop anything that created problems. If you want to be lean and scrappy, that's fine, but stop selling people on the grand visions. To make the sort of big, awesome games we were talking about, you need to be willing to make decisions. You need to hire and trust experts. You need to have a certain amount of planning. You can't keep running that like a two-person operation. Even when they were working on later chapters of Bendy, it was still their show. They'd tear out and remix everything other people made for them. And that's where you get a simple game that's mostly just walking around. Which is fine, I don't have a problem with that at all, 
Just stop telling people you're making this other kind of thing. The problems get more nuanced the closer you look at where the breakdowns were. It all gets a bit muddier, but the board was very hostile to working through the complex problems no matter what the team wanted or how much better it could have made the game. That's where you get this, just get it done, and we don't need to innovate sort of talk from them. But that all begs the fundamental question of why grow in the first place? Why hire all of Carmen to build this thing right? It was two conflicting visions of what Kindly Beast should be that never got reconciled. Are these screenshots from Showdown Bandit's pre-release Steam listing from the original build of the game, or from Mike and Meatly's? That's the team's version. The level designers worked so hard against an impossible deadline to make all that happen. I like the Meatly's level work, but I also thought this stuff was starting to look great, and more importantly, it was also being built in such a way that it had proper patrol paths for enemies, spots for collectibles that actually did things, etc. It was slower to come together than we wanted, but in my view it was coming together and it fit a larger set of design goals. Would you be able to tell me what this teaser image was? Given that Kelly Beast has been disbanded and Meatly and Mike have barely said a word, I'd hazard to say that we'd never know the answer unless you'd happen to be aware of it. Ah, oh, crap. I think I did know, but I forget. It might have even been from another game idea, in which case discussing that would violate my NDA. They had lots of cool ideas for games, and sharing anything about those is not something I can do. If you worked on Showdown Bandit, what was your reaction, or even the general reaction, to the Meatly and Mike taking over and remaking the game? When Mike and Meatly took over Showdown Bandit, it destroyed morale. Everyone had worked so hard on all the art and systems and gameplay, and felt so burned. Some people really cared about the story and world, and they were devastated to be told that that was all being thrown out. No one even knew what of their work would survive. We were all waiting for the release to see what would be used. The actual launch was brutal because that's when the team saw how little that had been used at all. Almost all the code, level design, story, and UI was gone. The board knew what was going on throughout development. People were giving them regular updates. They just couldn't decide, or else they wouldn't say, what they did and didn't really like. Just tell us what you want. Show us how to fix it. Then they released this thin shell of a game. The team wanted something immersive and interesting to play. The story was planned out for several chapters, I think, trying to have some mysteries for fans to pick apart. Instead, they just slapped some art assets together and released that. We had all heard all these fully voiced audio logs, and all sorts of cutscenes were already fully animated. They put in a couple of notes to read. I don't think they care about making good gameplay, and their approach to the story is to make something and see what fans make of it. Again, impossible to know what they were thinking. Here's how little they told us. They didn't even announce to the team when it was released. After being let go, were the Kindly Beast team helpful in finding you work, and did they ever try to privately apologize? Or did they even go the other way and attempt to sabotage your careers? Mike said that he had made amends with one of the VPs, but I'm curious if you or anyone you know of has been approached by Mike or any of the board to apologize and attempt to smooth things over, before or after Mike's statement in the GamesIndustry.biz article. Additionally, from what I've seen, it seems that Optimum Talent wasn't very helpful in finding everyone work. I got nothing from them in terms of communication or assistance. The offer to help was attached to signing a strict NDA about everything. Optimum Talent was probably a perfectly fine agency, but ultimately, some of these jobs don't exist in Ottawa. Really hard to find game art positions here. Programmers do a little better, but they could figure out a few game studios available without help. In terms of career sabotage, nothing directly. However, there was real risk of harming people. I don't know if it was deliberate or just super thoughtless, but Mood had been peddling stories about no game getting made, giving zero credit to the team for the efforts there. I know he's tried to sell this story publicly online, and maybe even more poignantly to the people in the Ottawa game dev community. How does that impact the careers of people, especially in lead roles, to say during this time they accomplished nothing? If you were running another studio in Ottawa, would you hire managers or tech slash art leads if you heard that story? It's untrue and harmful to people's careers. Thankfully, it seems it wasn't taken that seriously because Mood lacks credibility, and people did get hired in spite of it. I have wondered if it is legally actionable to say those things about your workers, though. What was it like, seeing everything fall apart day after day until you were fired? If you don't want to share, then you don't have to. 
Like I said, it was crushing. Different people handled it different ways. A lot of dark humor. It was a fantastic and supportive group of people, so we were trying to look out for each other. But some had it much worse, too. People had relocated, bought homes, they had asked about the health of the company, and they were promised we were fine. Quote, no one's job is at risk. Sometime later, I approached them with my follow-up questions. This is kind of a dumb question, but I realized I never asked. Were you all technically fired or laid off? I've seen people use both terms interchangeably, so I thought I'd just get that clarified. Technically fired. Fired without cause, which is a way of firing people where you don't have to give justification, but still have to pay a certain amount of severance. Then they gave everyone an envelope that asked us to sign something saying we wouldn't disparage the company for a small additional payout. The amount varied from person to person for reasons I did not understand. For clarification, you call out BookPass, The Meatly, Mike, and The Board at varying times. Would you be able to explain who all was on the board and if slash how their powers differ from, say, Mike being the CEO? Mike Mood and The Meatly said they were equal partners. BookPass is also a member of the board, but I'm not sure if he had any legal say in anything. In terms of the dynamic, it was very obvious by the end that Mood and Meatly liked to do a sort of good cop, bad cop thing. And then Mood seemed to deliberately take on the public heat, maybe to preserve the Meatly's friendly, caring persona. After all this, it's very hard to know how much, or if, the Meatly cared. But my understanding is that he had the stake in the company to stand up to Mood or stop him at any point. Would you be able to elaborate further on the sequence of events for Showdown Bandit's development? Right now, my impression of things is something akin to a team or a few project leads were originally just handed the IP and told to make a game before the Meatly and Mike began to demand more and more changes as the deadline became closer. There were a few characters to start and some ideas for what the game should be. They were handed to the guy put in charge and he was told he had to use those characters, but could do anything. He tried to lead on some early video demo, story, and gameplay ideas. Mood had wanted it to be like The Binding of Isaac, but the Meatly specifically didn't like that idea. So there wasn't a super unified vision. Randomness for replay was supposed to be a big feature. Because it was supposed to release in a pretty short time and be on a bunch of platforms, the development team was trying to build it right so you wouldn't get a bunch of terrible ports this time, after porting problems with Bendy. Over time, different people had different complaints, features got cut. I think it took a while to get the whole team together. But then they added too many people, and by the end wanted it to be exactly like their original ideas, not the designer they asked to make whatever he wanted. There was the team proper, and then a prototype happening in parallel to check a few specific things. There were some cool ideas. It seemed like lots of pieces were coming together. But then more and more cuts as people became concerned with the deadline. It was definitely a problem that very little of it was playable on any given day, but at least some people on the team were sure there was a core game there. At least as much as Bendy where you just walk around, find spooky stuff, have a vehicle for interesting characters, and a story. There was a lot of backstory, but Mood and Meatly explicitly threw all of that out. Just a few months before shipping, they brought a bunch of people into a room and decided to restart the whole thing, design a different progression through the game. There was a whole process, and it was a lot of stress and uncertainty for the team. No one was sure that could be pulled off, but the team tried really hard to make it happen. Then in the final month, Mood and Meatly started talking about just building something else themselves, grabbing assets and prototyping. One problem here was that Mood couldn't work with the complex code base the way he wanted. He wasn't used to a larger game built properly, so he was constantly frustrated when he couldn't quickly get things to work. So he started taking it apart, broke things horribly when the team had to merge his changes back in. It was a lot of disruption and floundering, and most of it seemed to be over cosmetic stuff. If they had just worked with the team, I'm sure it could have looked and felt the way they wanted, but also played better and had more character and story. There was a huge amount of dialogue and animation that was just thrown out. Audiologues that told the whole story of how the show came to be. But it wasn't their vision, so they tossed it. Would you be able to summarize the core concept or idea of the original Showdown Bandit? You can keep it as general or specific as you'd like. Was the game focused more so on the gameplay, overall story, specific characters, or overall aesthetics? The overall aesthetics were not super different from what was released. Level design was handled differently. The idea was a spooky, stealth action game. Random rooms and enemies, random weapons. You always had the ability to shoot your cork gun as a last line of defense, 
but you also lost a string if you missed, or if enemies reached out without the court gun being wound up. There was much more loot, and you could trade and eventually craft stuff to fight enemies. There was a lot of weird, complex story trying to be deep enough that fans would be guessing about characters and how the world works, with stuff planned out from the beginning that would pay off in later chapters. Story and world was very important. Gameplay went through a few revisions, but all built around a core that's sort of like what's there, just different mechanics. Mechanics I think most of the team would agree were better than what was released. How were the release dates decided, at least to your understanding? Based on deals with merch partners, I would think. Looking back, what do you think about Showdown Bandit, both the released and unreleased versions? There was an interesting vision with the unreleased version. The game that was planned originally sounded cool. What was left after cuts and direction changes wasn't much, but the plan to keep building it after initial launch still had some great ideas. What was released had some nice artwork, but there wasn't much of a game or any signs of a story or world that was really interesting. It was just a hollow, kind of neat-looking experience without much gameplay. I didn't actually play it, but heard it was really buggy and, even when working, pretty janky. Mood and Meatly were really hard on the team for having janky stuff in the game that was nowhere near as bad as what they released. Mike said regarding characters and LGBT representation that Kindly Beast makes, quote, characters defined by what they do, not who they identify as, end quote. Some have taken this to believe that Kindly Beast does not wish to put anything in their game that may be seen as offensive or political. Do you believe that Kindly Beast chooses to create non-political slash inoffensive characters, or could this simply be Mike's personal philosophy? They definitely wanted to avoid any controversial topics. They were very concerned with what people talk publicly about, even on your own social media accounts. Not much else to really confirm or contradict that statement. Are there any details you'd be able to share about Bendy and Nightmare Run? The team working on that also had some grand plans to make it more exciting, have lots of great art and sound added. It was neat. It's another one that it's too bad we'll never see. With that is the end of the first employee's interview. The second employee situation is a little more unique in that I had a conversation with them prior to providing the questionnaire. As such, there are a few details that weren't included, though I'm unsure for what reason. So, with their permission, I've done my best to reformat the conversation to focus on those details specifically. Do you have any specific instances in which any of the directors were in any way abusive in the workplace towards employees? There were times during a playtest session meeting of Benny and the Dark Revival where Mood would just be outright saying things were bad left and right, and when being showed the code base, would say everything was over-engineered to people who absolutely had way more coding experience and knowledge than he had. There was one time he just angrily bursted out saying, We are making games for stupid kids. This isn't hard. He would be overly critical of the code base and, if anything, belittling the accomplishments we had made. Did the Meatly or Book Past ever step in, say anything, address any of it, or were they completely complicit? Book Past was in the States somewhere, so he was never physically around except maybe once or twice, and Paul was just as complicit not saying anything against it and just saying stuff like, Hi, this is my friend Mike. He's not very sociable. Or something like that, just playing it off as a joke, which really just made it worse. And with Paul, he would constantly change his mind on design decisions for Dark Revival. Like he went through so many iterations just on the fly, we think he either was not properly explaining himself or could just not properly envision things in his head. How far along was Dark Revival before the layoff? We were essentially building the final level of Chapter 1. We had the cutscenes in pretty finished states and all the gameplay elements were done. It would have been ready on time for the October release we had. With Showdown, we would have also made our original date had they not yanked the project away from us last minute and gutted the thing to start from scratch. Not sure if you'd have anything particular to say about it, but what was the internal consensus on Sin? Clearly she's not been friendly towards you guys after the firings, but was it ever a problem while you were there? Sin seemed nice at face value while working there, but it was obvious we were not okay with her as HR because of her relationship with Mood. One of the VPs even said it's a conflict of interest upon handing her that position, and Mood's response was, What am I supposed to do? Take back the offer? Like, obviously, yeah. There were also some pretty obvious throwaway accounts that were made to talk bad about us after the firings, that we know it was her because we complained to them about it, and suddenly they all disappeared after we said something about it. Mike appears to have something of a reputation of being prone to lawsuits or threatening legal action. 
Did you ever experience or witness anything like that from him before or after the firings? With how he treated people and made it seem like he had no trust in us, after always touting the company was like family made us think that. Like, the day before we got fired, we started to get locked out of everything and to remember not to steal company property in our contractual obligations, and obviously that's just the lawyers talking, but he went through with that so either he's spineless or he agrees with them. And then there was the time he took everyone who used to work for Carmen the, like, day or so after firing the VPs and was just kind of grilling them, like, you guys aren't thinking of leaving, right? Which really showed there was no trust for that last month without the VPs. How do you or everyone else feel about Foxygen? I don't believe she was having an affair with Mike, though she stayed on after you all had been let go and was then fired during a global pandemic, no less. Have any of you spoken to her after she was fired? I don't. Many of us had much interactions with her personally, but we knew her and Pascal were rats. Anytime anything would get said around them, it would suddenly make its way to Mike and the board. One time, someone during a meeting said they were worried about job safety, and somehow that made its way back to Mike, and that employee got grilled out for it, which was insane. We had been told from the beginning that Foxygen and Mood were like best friends, and that at the time, she was like staying at this place he had rented in Austin, Texas, and she was like always staying there from what we knew. Honestly, no clue if they had anything going on. After she got fired, I'm pretty sure some of us reached out to her, but it was probably still with like, we don't trust her enough. Sorry for some tangents here and there. Mike said that someone spoke out in a meeting, saying that some employees didn't understand the direction the game was supposed to be going in, and that he agreed. Were both Dark Revival and Showdown both just being built kinda blindly? Dark Revival was overseen and designed by Paul, so it fell into what they wanted, but they handed off Showdown and never really oversaw any of it. All they gave was like maybe a quick document and a prototype and told them to run with it. So yeah, when they finally look at it and aren't happy with it, that's their own fault. The team worked their ass off and made something that was pretty fun and had a solid roadmap for future chapters, but they did not care because it was not what they had envisioned. The last thing anyone has heard about Bendy Nightmare Run was that, according to Mike, it was on hold like Showdown Bandit, which, if it goes the way of Showdown, it won't be playable anytime soon. I don't know if you knew or could share some of what those updates were, but I'd be curious to hear. To keep it brief, there was going to be new level design like running in different directions and loot boxes and a whole new suite of animations and designs. Those were the only details of note left out of the questionnaire. The following is... Well, the questionnaire itself. Just for clarity, is there a specific role, position, or department you specialized in during your time at Kindly Beast? Would you say you worked more so on the Kindly Beast side of things, or joined your studios? Worked as a software developer on the Kindly Beast side of things. To start things on a lighthearted note, what was with the coffee machine? What made the coffee so good? How do you feel about Bendy Blend, Kindly Beast's Bendy branded coffee blend, given the company's reputation? There really wasn't anything special about the coffee machine. It was a rented out stand-up coffee machine that could make a few different kinds of coffee and also hot chocolate. It just became part of inside jokes because many people would congregate around the coffee machine in the morning and chat. Is there a particular reason that you specifically have been so quiet about things? Has it been for the sake of moving on or has there been pressure to keep quiet? A little bit of both. There is some pressure to keep quiet, as the CEO Mike Mood has been litigious in the past when it came to defending everything Bendy related. My worry is that he has a fragile ego and speaking up publicly will grab his ire, and really having to deal with that is not worth my time or money. The other part is just moving on. It turned out that the company's board are who they are, and it's easier and less stressful to just keep living my life without them living rent-free in my thoughts. Would you say that the anonymous employees on Reddit and Glassdoor are credible, or would you happen to know for a fact that they were written by ex-employees? Not looking for names if you're not wanting to give them, I just want to know if what little info exists is accurate slash genuine. The anonymous employees on Reddit and Glassdoor are credible. Very soon before and after the layoffs happened, it was well known that many were posting reviews on Glassdoor. I even wrote a Glassdoor review myself. The Reddit user, xkindlybeast, is legit. They knew enough about all the inner workings of the company and showed on Bandit that unless someone bugged the office, the only way they would know that information was if they were an employee. What was day-to-day -day life like? Was there a pattern or were things constantly in flux? For the first few months, the day-to-day -day were quite good. 
we were allowed to focus on doing our work. Things went into flux when the board, Mike and the Meatly, seemed to get stressed about a few aspects and then their lack of leadership skills took over and they just wanted to do things themselves. Was there anything particularly weird that was required of you or anyone else? I assume there were no daily blood sacrifices, but I suppose I won't know until I ask. Nothing weird at all for the majority of employees. The only thing that really stands out is that at one point it seemed like the Meatly started to develop a crush on one of the female employees, and there was some general unease occurring between other people as they felt the way he acted was inappropriate. He even started changing the lore about some characters in one of the games to line up more with the employee mentioned. Did any of the directors display any anti-diversity behavior? Mike has a reputation of being a Gamergate supporter and claims to not have LGBTQ representation in their games because their characters are not defined by what they identify as. For many months, Mike wasn't there day to day and wasn't doing much of the interview and hiring. That was led by the very capable and understanding VPs who were let go a few weeks before the big layoff. Their ethos were much more about making sure things could be as inclusive as possible. Since Mike and the Meatly were probably only in the office for two weeks total the entire time I worked there, we didn't see any direct anti-diversity behavior. And yes, I can say that it is known that Mike was a known Gamergate supporter. Did any of the board have anything against other game devs in the area? I know Mike has feelings about Dirty Rectangles and Scott Cawthon, but did he ever say or do anything to reinforce those feelings? And did this mean that some places slash topic conversations were not allowed? Mike's problem with Dirty Rectangles is that they don't allow bigotry to events. Around the time that Gamergate was happening, Mike was at a Dirty Rectangles event. Near the beginning of that specific event, the organizers said something along the lines of, if you are a supporter of Gamergate and bigotry, you can just leave. This is a safe space for all. And Mike just up and left and never came to another meetup again. There were also some other drama, as his ex-wife had a previous relationship with someone else who would also go to Dirty Rectangles. So I think that also played a small factor in it. I don't know too much about his beef with Scott Cawthon, but I assume it's a dick-swinging contest between narcissists. Did you or any other ex-employees have problems with Sin, as HR or as a person? Many people have problems with Sin, who was basically the only HR person. People were feeling hurt and pressured by Mike's attitude about things. It becomes very hard to talk to HR when HR is the CEO's sister. Did you or any other ex-employees have problems with Foxygen, and is there any credibility to her having an affair with Mike? After what I've seen, I don't believe so, but that's just based on what's been made public. Foxygen worked from Austin, so many of us never interacted with her much. I have no idea if there's any credibility to her and Mike having an affair. The only thing I know is that Mike bought a house in Austin and was renting it out to people, one of those I believe was Foxygen, and he would spend time down there at the house. Can you recall any specific instances of abuse in the workplace? Mike's mood swings, threats, etc.? I use Mike as an example because he's the only one with public allegations of abuse. He would openly berate people's work. It was really shit behavior for someone who was supposed to be in a leadership role. He would complain that other people's code was too complicated. But that was because Mike has the skills of a junior programmer and he doesn't possess the skills to spend any time reading and researching other people's code. He would complain about things like, why can't we do this one thing right now, where the answer was usually, well that system was never in the game design document, how are we supposed to read your mind and write systems for unplanned, undocumented things? There was also some non-directed abuse towards the art team, things like, why doesn't this work right now, fuck it, I will just model and rig the character myself. Another example was that at one point, the Meatly did a pass on one small level design and lighting pass on one of the games, and when Mike saw it, his response was basically, See, the Meatly is awesome. This is how it should have been done from the get-go. This was all an earshot of the art team. Even though it wasn't directed abuse, I still feel that these instances are still abusive. Most of what was abusive were these passive-aggressive comments that he made over and over again. There were some more directed attacks, in private messages to some team members on Slack and on phone calls. I saw the evidence of that abuse even though it didn't happen to myself. However, I won't say any more of that, as those people who did get those abusive messages deserve to have some privacy. Were the Meatly and Book Pass complicit in Mike's behavior? The Meatly wasn't really complicit, but if he actually cared, he would have stood up to Mike to stem his behavior. Did Mike frequently use legal action as a means to an end, for employees or outside issues, when you were employed there? Has he threatened legal action since you were let go? 
He didn't threaten any legal action to anyone since we were all let go, as far as I'm aware. When the VPs were fired, do you know slash feel that this was due to them not adhering to the board's vision, or was there a different reason, like the beginning of the firings in a staggered fashion to avoid mass termination? The VPs being fired, in my opinion, were because Mike has a huge ego and wanted things done exactly the way he would do things. However, the VPs have way more experience working and managing larger teams and projects. Mostly it came down to that Mike believed that everyone should work starting at the beginning of the game. So an example would be that for Chapter 1, everyone would focus on the first room until that room was 100% done, then everyone would move on to the next room, and so forth. That system worked when it was just him and the Meatly working on the first game. However, when you have a team of 20 working, it is often best to stagger the work. Some of the major systems in art could be parallelized. That is the way most games get made. Not Mike Mood's terrible system that only works for two people. To add to the above system, he felt that we didn't need to keep track of the tasks at all, and everyone should always be at their coworker's desk talking about what should be done next. That just didn't work for a larger team. So when the VPs were pushing back on those types of processes on behest of the development team, I feel like Mike decided they were in his way and laid them off so he could exert more pressure on the team to work exactly like he wanted them to, rather than listening to the team to how they would like to work. I'm curious about how the board felt about their products. Bendy, for example, has had the lore change a few times, and get it done good enough doesn't exactly sound like the words of someone who cares about what they're making as long as it's done. Do you know if there was anything in particular the board was truly passionate about, or was it all just a product to them? The get it done good enough probably just stems from the fact that Mike cared more about money and milking the fan base rather than making a sustained company and product. That can be shown with how they ran Kindly Beast. I feel like it was all just a product to them. I am not aware if there was anything that they were truly passionate about. Was Shodown Bandit and or Dark Revival a painful trial and error built game with no direction because the board kept shooting things down while not being involved? I absolutely think that there's credit that's due for Showdown Bandit in terms of models, sound effects, and a few other details, but I didn't know if any on the board or vice producers were slash should have been overseeing the project specifically. Showdown Bandit was more a trial and error built game with no direction. They made a very basic idea of what Showdown Bandit should have been, and then the original release date was going to only be 5 months from when it was started. That is a very short amount of time for a game of that scope. From seeing the build of Showdown Bandit before the board took over, and the one that Mike and the Meatly did, I will say the one before was better than the Mike slash Meatly version. The really frustrating part is that they were super critical about any bug found in the previous version. But then in their version, there were so many bugs that some of them they just decided to leave in as easter eggs for YouTubers to find. The cognitive dissonance there was astounding. Dark Revival had more direction as that was their bread and butter. However, once they went away to work on Showdown Bandit for a month a bit, and shut down any communication between the board and the rest of the team, it became harder. Dark Revival was creating a bunch of systems that were designed to alleviate many of the issues from the original Bendy game. Things such as better level loading, saving, etc. Are these screenshots from Showdown Bandit's pre-release Steam listing from the original build of the game, or from Mike and Meatly's? I honestly can't remember if those screenshots are from which version of the game. Would you be able to tell me what this teaser image was? Given that Kenley Beast has been disbanded and Meatly and Mike have barely said a word, I'd hazard to say that we'd never know the answer unless you'd happen to be aware of it. I don't immediately recognize that silhouette. If I were to guess, it would be a silhouette of a planned new character slash villain for the Showdown Bandit franchise. I don't know if you'd be willing to share, but what was the original Showdown Bandit in Dark Revival like? From what Micah said, Chapter 1 of Dark Revival had 3 hours of content in Chapter 1, and Showdown Bandit was fairly interesting in terms of complexity and details. I'd love to know as much as you'd be willing to share. The original Showdown Bandit had much more potential than what was released. They just weren't willing to let timelines slip until they took control of it and then realized how much work was to be done. So they started partially from scratch and made a worse game compared to what they took over. Having the rest of the team take those same 7 or so weeks to polish and new things would have been amazing to see. Dark Revival is harder to talk about since they never released a gameplay trailer of the original version. They only released a teaser that was just an animatic that happened to be rendered in-engine. There was no gameplay code happening, so no user input, no locomotion, no collision, nothing. I think the best way to describe what the original Dark Revival was going to be was that it felt inspired by Bioshock. After being let go, were the Kindly Beast team helpful in finding you work, and did they ever try to privately apologize? 
Or did they even go the other way and attempt to sabotage your careers? Mike said he had made amends with one of the VPs, but I'm curious if you or anyone you know of has been approached by Mike or any of the board to apologize and attempt to smooth things over, before or after Mike's statement in the GamesIndustry.biz article. Additionally, from what I've seen, it seems that Optimum Talent wasn't very helpful in finding everyone work. I don't think they ever reached out to privately apologize to anyone as far as I'm aware, but didn't go out of their way to sabotage anyone either. The Kindly Beast team were terrible in helping find work. Optimum Talent weren't going to be much better. Many of the developers found work very quickly. The artists had a bit more of a hard time finding work from what I saw. One thing that irked me about that GamesIndustry.biz article, or another one, was Mike mentioning that they worked with another studio, Snowden Studios, to get people work. However, that was far from the case. The president of Snowden Studios ran the job fair on his own, as he has very strong feelings about keeping game development talent in Ottawa, and was aware of the talent that was just laid off. Mike Mood or Kindly Beast had nothing to do with what Snowden did. Mike then also had the audacity to tell the president of Snowden that, quote, he didn't know the whole story of the layoffs. Mike was setting himself to seem like the victim in the press and in other people's mind, but luckily most people easily saw past that. What was it like, seeing everything fall apart day after day until you were fired? If you don't want to share, then you don't have to. It was really stressful, even more so for some others. Some went on medical stress leave because of how things were going the last six to eight weeks before the mass layoffs. It was kind of surreal since the studio was really new and they were spending so much money on hiring and other things too. During that time, the team really came together and supported each other. The morning of the layoffs, we all knew it was happening, so we all just relaxed in the adjacent office, gossiping, making sure everyone had a way to stay in contact with the rest of the team. There was even some impromptu resume reviews and other things like that for helping out others for what was to come. After the layoffs, we all took a picture with our pink slips outside as a little fuck you, you won't make us feel down. Many people all still stay in contact. Is there anything else you'd like to share or make known? I know I've asked a lot of questions, but if there's something you want out there that my questions haven't covered, then go for it. One thing I would like to mention is that Mike Mood, I think, falsely claims things online to garner sympathy from his fans. He said in the Reddit AMA, he only owns two things, his two cars. I highly doubt that. He would brag about having to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in personal income tax the past few years, and brag about the money he had. He lived in a nice fancy house in a nice part of Ottawa, bought expensive furnishing for that house, and a bunch of other tells where I find it hard to believe. However, it may be true that he doesn't own that house, because Mike declared bankruptcy in the past, which makes it really hard to secure any kind of credit. That actually made it hard for some things to run as a company for Kindly Beast. Since he had no credit and was the owner of Kindly Beast, he couldn't get corporate credit cards, which made it hard for acquiring some software licenses. Related to the Reddit AMA, he also basically passed the blame of the layoffs on two things, the CFO and the VPs. The first who said they were running out of money, the second who he blames for hiring too many people. For the VPs, they thought the company was going to be around 35 to 40 people. It was Mike and the board that pushed for more and more hiring. They signed off on all new hires and set the budget for hiring. That hiring could not have happened under the nose of Mike. That is just him blaming someone else besides himself. He also blamed the CFO for not warning earlier about the money situation. The CFO, for the record, was an accounting firm, so not one individual. However, my guess is that the CFO was trying to make Mike aware of the financial situation, but for a while, Mike wasn't answering Slack or emails while he was purely focused on reworking Showdown Bandit. It also seemed like some of the financial woes of the company coincided with his divorce finalizing. Again, after looking over their responses, I came up with some follow-up questions. You mentioned how Bendy and the Dark Revival was inspired by Bioshock. Could you elaborate on that? Also, how much of an influence was Bioshock to Kindly Beast in general? It was inspired by Bioshock as in the playable character was going to have abilities on one hand and weapons on the other, not too dissimilar from Bioshock 1 and 2. There was also going to be more verticality in the game, but that wasn't really Bioshock inspired. Would you be able to share any details regarding Bendy and Nightmare Run? Were there further plans for content, or was it abandoned by the time you were hired? There were lots of further plans for it. There was a team working on improving lots of aspects of it, and they made huge gains in terms of player retention and a bunch of other metrics. 
That was also only the first phase of a multi-phase plan. Once the layoffs happened, Bendy and Nightmare Run got abandoned. Some have speculated the influence merchandising may have had on the games during development. Do you know or believe that to be the case? Merchandising was really the board's main thought. They were making games to sell merchandise. That was their business goal. Characters in the games were designed with merchandising in mind from the get-go. Finally, I wanted to ask if you believe any playable versions of the original Showdown Bandit or Benny the Dark Revival still exist, and if you think they will ever be made public. There are probably playable versions of the original Showdown Bandit and Benny the Dark Revival games, but they will most likely never see the light of day. The legal ramifications of releasing that to the public would be too high. That is something Mike, the Kindly Beast board, and more would very aggressively try to prevent. But, as they should. It is their intellectual property, and they need to defend it. And... that's it. I cannot thank these people enough for taking the time to answer all these questions. Reopening old wounds over a year later, all because of some guy who made a YouTube video about their previous job that sucked. As someone who has spent countless hours looking for answers, reading tweets, and trying to verify anonymous claims, being able to ask direct questions and get straightforward responses from people who were there was nothing short of amazing. And, at long last, this is all the information I could gather regarding the controversy. As for cross-referencing details and reconstructing a whole new timeline of events, that may be a bit much. Whatever you believe will change how a timeline of events is developed. I've done my best to present as much information as I could, and you're free to come to your own conclusions. But I think it's time for this video to reach its conclusion. So, what now? How do you conclude a saga that's involved so many different things, so many moving parts? What comes next? For the company, its games, for you, and for me? Well, let's take it one thing at a time. I want to start with closing the book on where this all began. What caused the descent of Kindly Beast and has been a symbol for it ever since. Showdown Bandit. It's a shame that Showdown Bandit's first roundup was also its last. Odds are we'll never see a revival, let alone the original version. Despite a teaser image being released on the Showdown Bandit Twitter account in December 2020, depicting the bandit rising from his box, there's little else that indicates any interest in a property that is ultimately overshadowed by the controversy it led to. Showdown Bandit was a loss, in more ways than one. $10 million, countless hours of work from dozens of employees, only to have the project scrapped and overhauled for a version that yielded mixed reviews and poor sales. In many ways, its potential was limitless. Given their approach to Bendy, I have no doubt that the Kindly Beast executives would have planned to see it grow into its own universe, complete with spin-off books and games. Its top-down perspective may have also lent it well to its own board game. As for the game itself, its emphasis on survival and crafting may have been the perfect counterbalance to Bendy's straightforward, if lackluster gameplay, with an equally strong atmosphere. Maybe the original would have performed just as poorly as the one we got, but at the very least, it would have certainly been more interesting. A testament to what those fired were capable of. After all, there's nothing wrong with a cult classic. Instead, all that's left are glimpses. The animations and assets in the released version, screenshots from the original Steam listing, footage from the trailer, and whatever information next employees have been willing to share. In some ways, it's become far more mysterious than anything the released version ever alluded to. A video game enigma, only ever seen by those who made it. When Showdown Bandit was released, I didn't enjoy it. But now, after searching through all that's happened, I think it holds a special place in my heart. Not the game we got, not even the controversy linked to it, but the game it should have been. As for a revival, I think it's better to let it rest rather than stringing up the dead. Now, what about Kindly Beast and their flagship franchise? Before talking about Kindly Beast and Dark Revival, I think it's important to acknowledge that Bending Ink Machine was an important kind of horror. 
accessible horror. Not everyone is willing to try a horror game like Outlast when they've only ever played games like Minecraft, Portal, and Mario Kart. Having a less intense introduction to the horror genre can be a great thing, and I feel that can go overlooked. I know people who had Bendy as one of their introductions into horror games, and they've been willing to try more intense experiences like the Resident Evil franchise since then, because now they better understand how survival horror games operate at their base components. Also, people become attached to things. There are people who love Bendy and hate that this controversy exists, because it forces them to confront the reality of the games industry, while there are people who use video games as a form of escapism. Bendy was, and still is, an important game to a lot of people, and not everything about Bendy needs to be dismissed or somehow forgotten. It's that the actions of the people who made the game are also important to acknowledge. In the previous video, I laid out what I feel would be the best course of action to begin fixing Kindly Beast mistakes, and honestly, none of that has really changed, though neither has Kindly Beast. Instead, they've continued on as though nothing has happened, using much the same talk about making games for their fans as with Showdown Bandit, which, after the events of Showdown Bandit, now feels less personal and more deceptive than anything. The only thing that can speak for the company now is their actions, and they've done very little in the last few years. The passage of time without any action doesn't make what they did any less relevant, especially as a customer. There's no reason to believe that Kindly Beast has changed how they make their games. If anything, their silence on the situation and attempt to cover up the allegations should make them all the more untrustworthy, until they, at the very least, apologize. An apology can be a powerful thing. It acknowledges what happened, shows remorse for what they did, and comes with the implication that they intend to do better. Yes, Mike apologized for the firings, but there's a lot more than that that's gone unanswered by him, the Meatly, and Book Past. Until there's an apology, Kindly Beast will not only exist as the antithesis of their company description, but as the cartoonishly evil studio portrayed in their flagship title. It would be fitting if, upon buying and starting up their next Bendy title, there was just a game over screen. Joey Drew Studios won. As of writing this, Bendy and the Dark Revival has yet to be released. The game has essentially been delayed indefinitely, with the only progress shown being a handful of screenshots featuring some objects and locations. Some cite the continued delays of the game as evidence that the team isn't willing to quickly assemble a game with a good enough attitude, but even in making a product designed to sell other products, there's still a level of effort required. They have to put enough content into the game so that it exceeds Steam's refund playtime of two hours, otherwise players may just refund the game if they're not satisfied with it. They also have to optimize the game's graphics so that it can be sold to almost anyone using any setup. There's also a matter of making a game appealing to content creators. Even if they play the game, plenty of Let's Players scrap videos when they feel the content isn't entertaining. Finally, they have to find products to sell to players that they can also realistically produce. The plushies in Chapter 3's toy shop was a brilliant move, but Showdown Bandit's merchandise wasn't incorporated into the game, and the plushie counterparts to most characters were... well, strange, to say the least. Yes, they didn't rush out a half-baked buggy mess... yet. Time is not always indicative of a quality product for the benefit of the player, and until the game is out, it's possible that the game will have bugs and an incomplete story. The firing of their senior staff would certainly point to this likelihood. Despite some screenshots and the Meatly's tweets, some of the Bendy fanbase has reached its limit on how long they're willing to put up with the occasional teases as the only kind of update for the game. It's hard to be excited for a game when so little is known, and verbal updates by the developers have become untrustworthy. While I don't endorse harassing developers, and I feel development work is still greatly misunderstood by those who play games, this is exactly the kind of fanbase Kindly Beast have begun to reduce themselves to when they're only willing to engage with their fans on a promotional level, rather than responding or apologizing for the numerous allegations. By icing out those who care about how a game is made, they'll eventually be left with those who care only about the brand. Those fans will buy Bendy products out of brand loyalty, regardless of quality or its development, but they care only about the brand. They don't care about any controversy or the quality of the game, but they also don't care about how it's made. All they want is more, and nearly three years without any new content beyond a spin-off is probably testing their patience. They don't care about how the games are made, and Kindly Beast has shown that they don't care about their fans. In a way, they deserve each other. If I can make some predictions, I can't help but feel that Dark Revival will in some way respond to the controversy. 
The parallels between Joey Drew and Kindly Beast leaders run deep. So I'd imagine they'll either have Joey do something truly cruel and disturbing to make the comparison seem absurd, or humanize Joey Drew to convey the sympathy they wish to have reflected on them, rather than actually answering for their behavior. I can't say for sure what will happen from here. The game might be incredibly successful like the original, or maybe it'll just do okay like Boris in the Dark Survival. Maybe it'll be the game everyone wished the original would have been, or maybe it'll be another disappointment like Showdown Bandit. But, after looking at everything that's happened, no matter what happens next, the spirit of these games will live on. Bendy is another game in the long list that were inspired by the franchises of Ultima Underworld, System Shock, and Bioshock, regardless if you think it's an evolution or a poor imitation. It's not the first, and it won't be the last. Bioshock inspired the Meatly to make video games, and there's a good chance that Bendy will do the same for others. That seems fairly evident given the existence of Bendy fan games and their persistence despite Kindly Beast attempts to remove them. In fact, that may speed up the cycle. If fan games are going to be taken down for using the Bendy IP, then making a fan game without any Bendy IP would seem like the next logical step. At that point, it's basically its own original product. A tribute, sure, but legally distinct. Sounds familiar? With the right idea from the right people, enough support, and a bit of luck, it could outdo Bendy's gameplay, narrative, and even its success. All we can hope is that whatever game comes after Bendy learns from both the game's shortcomings, as well as those of its creators. So then, what do you do now? Honestly, that's up to you. These videos were made to help people have an easier time understanding the situation than I had trying to research it, so you could come to your own conclusions and make an informed decision on whether you're comfortable supporting Kindly Beast. Maybe you'll never buy from them again because of what they've done, maybe you'll be skeptical of them going forward, or maybe you never bought anything of theirs to begin with. Maybe you feel fine still supporting them, and at least now you understand what you're getting yourself into, or maybe you want to abandon them, but you feel too attached to their creations. This situation is messy, and everyone is different, so whatever you choose, I'm not going to belittle or blame you. All I could hope for is you to make an informed decision on the company, as an artist, as a fan, or even just as a customer. So, hopefully, now you can. If you want to do something about Kindly Beast, not buying their products is the easiest thing you can do. Bendy has a large enough fan base to where it might not sound as though it would make much of a difference, but even if just half of the people who liked the previous video were Bendy fans, and only a third of them are no longer going to buy Dark Revival, that could mean a difference in sales of about $100,000. And that sends quite the message. Kindly Beast believes fans won't care about the quality of their games, how they treat their employees, how they treat artists, or even what they think of their fans. So long as the final product has the Bendy logo, the product will sell and nothing needs to change. It's up to fans to prove them wrong. If Bendy fans truly deserve the best, then Kindly Beast needs to deliver on more than just a game that wasn't rushed. Beyond not buying their products, sharing these videos to help inform others and telling Kindly Beast how you feel is probably the best thing you could do. It might be an uphill battle, but it's not impossible for them to listen and change. Even the most tone-deaf decisions made by some of the biggest names in gaming have been changed with enough outcry. Just in 2021, Sony planned on closing the PlayStation Vita and PS3 stores, allegedly due to maintenance costs and a desire to focus more on future consoles. Instead, the backlash was enough for Sony to reconsider and cancel the shutdown for the foreseeable future. Microsoft's Xbox Live Gold, their subscription service required to play any online games, was going to increase in price from $9.99 a month to $10.99. They even removed the $60 12-month option, and with the next best option being 6 months now at the same price, it meant that the price for a year's worth of gold was now doubled. Despite the financial incentive to stand by their decision, Microsoft saw the response from players and not only backtracked their plans, but even made free-to-play online games no longer require a gold subscription. Microsoft not only maintained their status quo, but went further and made free games on their consoles truly free-to-play. Again, it might not change anything, but there's no harm in trying if you're not outright harassing anyone. If you want to have some fun with it, the domain names of MikeMood.com, ClubMeatly.com, and BendyBlend.com all redirect to a YouTube playlist with these videos. 
However, these domains are only temporary. They require an annual subscription fee, so you might be better off linking back to the actual playlist. And if you want to do something more positive, either with your time or money, then I can think of some people who could do with some support and a little positive attention. Whether you continue to support Kindly Beast or not, I think a good thing to do would be to support the people who've been screwed over by the events of this controversy. After spending so much time talking about all the horrible things they've gone through, I think it's the least I can do. So if any of what I'm about to say interests you, then by all means, click the Linktree link in the description and go send these people some love. While some ex-employees work for studios and don't have a large body of work on social media, I want to at least feature the ones who do. If you like short, well-edited videos about games, particularly Nintendo and Super Smash Bros., then Schmidt Times might be worth a try. He breaks down the origins of fighters' moves, pitches concepts for new fighters, and a bunch of other stuff, like a Mario Party quiz show that is criminally underrated. Daniel Bennett has been working in his spare time to remake Banjo-Tooie. I feel like the effort and care required to take on a project like that speaks for itself. As for artists, there's no shortage, be it 3D or 2D. Belden Fam, really hope I said that right, makes some really awesome 3D animations and 2D art, whose previous work includes Hilda and the Mountain King. Ricky Pistols, aka a name I'm still too afraid to pronounce, has also done both, and he even has a Redbubble full of some pretty cool designs. At Lizalot Draws on Twitter is where Lizalot draws. Pixel art, digital, and some phenomenal traditional works. Then there's Connor Grail, whose music really does speak for itself. In fact, I've used some of his music in this video. He also does 2D art as well. In April of 2021, his character Newground Server Chan got some particular popularity. Brendan Bauman is a character art production lead for Rainbow Six Siege, a game my brother plays religiously. Or at least Brendan was when I first wrote this script. Now he's an art director on Halo. He also sells environmental assets on the Unity Asset Store. There's also Mike Keo. I'm really sorry if I said that wrong, and he's both a composer and also a co-founder of Breakfall, an indie studio that has made games such as Marvin's Mittens, for which he was composer and director. And I know someone who can advocate for the game's quality. Uh, this game is actually really cool. Visually, it looks stunning. Like, the graphics are really good. The, the movement is really good as well. Uh, the story is pretty interesting, and there, there's a lot to it in terms of uh, exploration and stuff like that. It is really fun. It's just a, a fun, simple game. An excellent game, tons of fun. Uh, it's $5 on Desura. Thomas Pride was a programmer on a little game known as Cuphead. It's crazy to think that someone who worked on Cuphead was potentially going to help develop the next Bendy title, but also, I just love Cuphead, so I had to mention it. Right now, he's the lead developer on Terra Invicta, a sci-fi strategy game set to release later this year. After being let go from Kindly Beast, Matt Goals and Pascal Claro have become their own bosses. Pascal is making 3D models that people can print, and Matt is making a game called Finnegan Flint in the Opal Gems, an open world platformer with an aesthetic akin to that of Paper Mario or Yoshi's Woolly World. When it comes to winners of the Chapter 5 fan art contest, while I wasn't able to track down all five, I know Dalton, Nadine Churl, and Aboko, I hope I said those right, all still make fan art for things. Aboko still does amazing bendy fan art, and I particularly love Dalton's Minecraft works. Meme Lord Spence is still making renders, and certainly living up to the title. Anorak Warriors is still making games, most recently making a mod for Friday Night Funkin'. As for other bendy fan games, I want to take a moment to mention them in particular, if for no other reason than their persistence despite Kindly Beast's best efforts. All of these are on Game Jolt, and free to anyone with a spare time and appropriate hardware. None of these are perfect masterpieces, but neither was Bendy. What these do have is an incredible display of enthusiasm, skill, and creativity using the Bendy IP. Most of these are just demos, but I sincerely hope they become fully-fledged games. The point is, this community is greater than the original game or its creators, and I think their efforts are worth supporting. Especially since all the games themselves are free and made because people want to show their own take on the Bendy franchise. Not to sell a bunch of merchandise. Again, if any of what I've mentioned sounds like something you'd enjoy, there's a link in the description that'll direct you to whatever you're looking for. You can also type in linktree.com slash joeydrewstudios and the list is there as well. 
I hope that I've linked to everyone whose public work could do with some support, but if I've missed any, then I'll place them at the top of the list. Finally, there are plenty of other small indie games out there that deserve your support, but it may take some digging to find them. Check GameJolt, check itch.io, check hashtag IndieDev on Twitter, or browse Reddit if you have the mental fortitude. You might be surprised by what you find. And if you want to play the game that inspired Bendy, then Bioshock goes on sale every few months and is available on pretty much every console. I promise, it's a decade-old game that is still well worth your time. And if you don't believe me, then hopefully the video I'm working on will help change your mind. Or maybe it'll be another rabbit hole like this one, because I guess this is my life now. Speaking of, I guess the only other person I haven't talked about yet is... me. Me. The fanboy who started a YouTube channel talking about Bendy, bought countless pieces of merchandise, and who now stands as one of its critics. Most of my opinions are the same as before. I don't intend to support Kindly Beast, but I don't blame anyone for buying their games. Although now, I'm glad there's an even larger body of evidence to go by. So, how do I want to end this? Well, I thought about doing a dramatic, long-winded speech, maybe burning my Bendy merchandise I've collected over the years. I even had music picked out. But I think instead, I'd like to pull back the curtain a bit. Bendy was never a perfect game, but it's one I have a certain amount of respect for, even today. And while I do still enjoy Chapter 4, that respect I have is because no other game did what Bendy has done for me. It helped me understand how games were made and encouraged me to look at every game I play with a new perspective. Most people reach a point when they realize the games they love are made by artists, programmers, and level designers. Sometimes it's the work of hundreds, other times it can be just one person. To read the success stories of Notcher Scott Cawthon is one thing, but to see it happen in real time was something different. Being there from that first week Chapter 1 was released, the Meatly and Mike quitting their jobs to work on the game full time, and the progression of the game itself, as each chapter got bigger and the previous ones were updated. It's something I wanted to share with my original Story of Bendy series, because as basic and as dumb as it sounds, I never thought a game with such success could have all started with a couple of guys who happened to have a free weekend and a good idea. Bendy's creation and rise in popularity gave me a greater appreciation for games, because it's remarkable how humble that success can come from, and even how much the end product can reflect the development and those behind it. Bendy also happened to be the game that taught me that a game's creation can not only elevate your appreciation for it, but can make you reconsider how much that end product means to you. If the creators not only lie to you, but take advantage of nearly everyone they can, then does it matter how good their game is if it only proves that they can do what they want without any consequence? To me, if the greatest game of all time could only be made through a system of abuse, then that game wasn't worth making, and certainly isn't worth supporting the abusers who would benefit from buying it. My very first video about Kindly Beast back in 2019 was supposed to be one reviewing Showdown Bandit, and how I felt there had been so many missed opportunities and some hiccups in the game's design. In trying to figure out what went wrong, I instead stumbled upon a rabbit hole of mismanagement, verbal abuse, dishonesty, and, well, every topic I've covered. I could have just uploaded all the screenshots I had to some file-sharing website, posted it to Twitter, and hoped word would spread that way, but I didn't think that was the right thing to do. I felt that everyone deserved to know what was known about the situation without having to put in the same amount of effort as I had. It was not only to help everyone else understand what had happened, but to challenge myself to look even further at the available information, consider the possibilities, and articulate my own opinions. I also wanted there to be a discussion. Even if I was wrong in my conclusions, then someone would be able to see all the information I had spent nearly half a year looking at and help me see a more plausible conclusion. Then, at the start of 2020, I began suffering from an unknown illness and with COVID spreading, I was afraid I wouldn't live to see the Kindly Beast video completed, and even if I did, I thought that might be all I would leave behind. Much like any other video I make, I poured everything I had into that video. The difference was that it was a much longer video than I had ever made, on a complicated and controversial topic, 
and there was the pressure of it being my final project. It was never about one quality of the video. What it was about was making a video that, in some way, was worth your time. Even though I went into the video with the expectations of speaking to an audience of Bendy fans, I wanted to lay everything out in a way that was easy to understand, regardless of what you knew about the controversy prior. After I had released the video, over time, I realized that my video achieved exactly what I had hoped. Spreading information and starting a discussion. I wasn't sure how many people would actually care about any of this. That maybe people wouldn't be interested. Turns out, a lot of people wanted to know what happened. Like I said at the start, this video only exists because of the responses my previous video received. After speaking to so many people, I felt they deserved a platform I could hopefully provide. It also meant I would get to cover topics that I hadn't before, out of fear of making the video too long, and also try and properly articulate my thoughts on minorities being in the game, which I really hope I did better on this time. While I'm also still fighting this illness, I know my voice may have been rough in some parts of this video, I know I'll be around for some time longer. I'm just glad I'll get to keep making videos. My The Story Of format was meant to be a series that would highlight some of my favorite games as well as their creation. I love talking about a game that does so many things right as well as what makes its development special. As I said, I think game development is generally misunderstood by most people who play games, and it can shed a whole new light to a game that you love and give you some appreciation to even a game you hate. While I've got some videos planned for games I love, Bioshock, Papers, Please, and Celeste, I'd also like to cover more mysterious and controversial games. Hello Neighbor, PT, and Five Nights at Freddy's. If any of that interests you, feel free to stick around. Maybe look at my Patreon if you'd like to support me directly. I'll keep an eye on Kindly Beast as usual, and I'll gladly interview anyone willing to share their story with me, but unless any more surprises crop up, I'm finally free to see beyond the door I came in almost five years ago. After all, there are other worlds of games worth exploring that span from the highest mountain to deep below the ocean. It'll be nice to finally talk about a game I enjoy again, and hopefully the next time I do some detective work, it won't take up a whole hard drive. So... I guess that covers everything. The only thing I have left to say is that, after everything that's happened, the support from the previous video has helped me push forward to completing this one. It proved to me that people care about how a game is made and learning all the facts of a controversy. So I wanted to do as much as I could to make this video as informative and coherent as possible. It's been a long journey, both this last year and the last five. So, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for watching, and hopefully it was worth your time. Mm -hmm.